All right, let's do this, folks. What's going on? Welcome to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Andrew Patterson along with you with Michael Remus. And we have a very, very fun and exciting show coming up today. Lots to get to on the Winnipeg Jets, who host the Washington Capitol tomorrow night. And more on the Bombers. Big party last night at IG Field. Shout out to everyone that made it out there. Great to see so many Winnipeg Sports Talk listeners. And YouTube viewers out at it, even Manny Fran, whose wife allowed him to go, was part of the festivities tonight. Uh, you know, it was a great, great, it was a little chilly, uh, but nothing compared to that West Final. It wasn't quite as long either, and uh, what a great night it was for Blue Bomber fans and the entire Blue Bomber family to celebrate back-to-back -back championships. Uh, more on the Bombers' great, great cup victory. Ed Tate's going to join us in the second hour of the program and I, I think you all know that Murat Atesh of The Athletic is one of my favorite dudes to uh, chop it up with on this program. Murat has a very interesting piece in The Athletic. It dropped this morning. It is on Mark Shifley. It is on his usage. It is on the things that he brings to the table well for the Winnipeg Jets, but also some of the things that, you know, have been holding he and the team back, as well as that relationship with Paul Murray. It's going to be a very interesting conversation We'll be doing that first coming up in about 15 minutes on the program. And we're also going to be announcing our winner <clears throat> of these prime tickets for tomorrow's game with Alexander Ovechkin and the Washington Capitals coming to Canada Life Center to take on the Winnipeg Jets. Big thanks again to our friends over at Canadian Club. And uh, thanks to everybody that entered. And um, let's get Remus in here. Just as I quickly uh, thank all of our sponsors, not just Canadian Club, uh, but F Apparel, Vita Health, Culligan Water, Manitoba Battery, Royal Sports, Not Auto Corp, Little Brown Jug, Princess Auto, Boston Pizza, the Nick and Nicky DQ Group, and I see DQ Nick already in the chat. What's up, Nick? Of course, Canadian Club and our betting partner, Cool Bet Canada. Uh, but Remo, lots to get to right off the bat. And later on in the program, say uh, maybe when we're done with uh, Murata Tesh, we hope to hear from Coach Paul Maurice and a certain a certain new member of the Winnipeg Jets uh, will announce the winner for the contest. But thanks to everyone that went to winnipegsports.com, clicked on contest, whether you were with us live on YouTube or listening to the podcast later, got a ton of entries. Thanks to everyone that followed some of the other social media accounts as well. And we will announce that winner a little bit later on. But uh, Reem, we know what sound we're going to start the show off today, I think. Um, we've been waiting for a while. We expected it to come. And uh, the garage door has been opened for the Gus bus. Oh, wait, I, I got to get it set up. So uh, we, but yes, the Gus bus but is you... here. One sec, one sec. The Gus bus is here. Uh, the garage door is open. Sorry, I've been si I had been sitting on this graphic, too, for like a week that I, uh, I tweeted out from our account. So hold on. I'm getting. We can, we can pull that. We can pull that up for the folks that are with yeah. us in YouTube. I'll uh, welcome everyone. Actually, I should get the YouTube feed up on my screen as well. As we are live, and I can sort of follow what's happening with the uh, with the chat. Uh, yes, full speed. Eric's here. Troy Stevens, what's going on? All right, wrench doozer, always here. It's your boy Bruce. Hey, WST, nice to see us and meet you last night. Remus, one of the many folks that was out there. Todd for Tanny's there. Todd, big game tonight. AFC West. Mm. Well, I maybe hit the NFL a little bit later on, but um. Uh, as I said, lots going on with the Winnipeg Jets. They did practice today. We'll hear from David Gustafson, uh, hopefully a little bit of Paul Maurice later on as well. And we will talk with Murata Tesh. Uh, but uh, maybe an, a bit of an anticlimactic recall today, Remus, because with the mm -hmm. uh, 
Riley Nash's waiver claim by Tampa and Blake Wheeler's injury. Um, the only surprising thing was that it took this long, and it was partly because of the salary cap, and then it was because of a COVID scare with the Manitoba Moose. Uh, but finally, David Gustafson's back in the National Hockey League here with the Winnipeg Jets and should make his season debut tomorrow night against the Caps. Yeah, here. I'm ready now. I got the graphic. Sorry, I was caught off guard. I don't know why to start, but if you're not... And if you're not following us on social media, make sure you do that. Um, here's the picture. Um, I, I've been had it like ready since last week. We've been waiting to go with this Gossman. Yeah, since Riley Nash, so pretty anticlimactic, but uh, I'll toss it on here. There we go. Lovely. I told our designer, uh, Timo, he does some of our graphics. I was like, I want David Gustafson on a bus. I want to say Gus Bus <laughs> on it. You do the rest. And uh, he put this thing together. Uh, this is just uh, absolutely in incredible. So uh, very fired up for the Gus Bus. Sorry for derailing uh, the entire show, as <laughs> Rob Mahoney mentioned uh, earlier in chat. Yeah, I, I should have been more ready. Oh, well. Hey, you know what? There's lots going on today. I mean, the fact of the matter is coming into the, the show, um, you know, you will usually you know, talk about some of the obvious things that we're going to be talking about kicking around a few other things and then all of a sudden we got this blue bomber schedule mm -hmm. um i mean the party isn't even finished reem and we're already looking ahead to a home and home i know everyone was ch was choked that we didn't get a chance to see ottawa this season for many reasons not just that paul laparis our old friend is now the head coach out there in ottawa but they're going to start off with that a home and home against the Ottawa Red Blacks next season. Of course, uh, we got the Banjo Bowl back here on a Saturday afternoon, 4 p.m. start, the Labor Day Classic. Um, maybe we'll go through that a little bit later on with Ed Tate, although I think still the focus of our Bomber conversations is going to be on uh, on the championship, running it back, everything that happened on Sunday. Um, but Remo, we're seeing a bunch of comments from folks that are, you know, that maybe said hi to us who were there last night. What a cool scene it was at IG Field last night as uh, seven, 8,000 Bomber fans braved the elements, showed up, stood up, and partied with the Grey Cup champs for a good 90 minutes plus last night uh, outdoors. Yeah, I thought it was pretty awesome. And it's funny, we got there and I was like, you know, usually when you go to cold playoff games, like you don't have to do them for like years and you kind of forgot how cold it was and you're eager to go back. We got there and I was like, I didn't think I would be here like 10 days after the West final, which I've referred to as inhumane conditions, <laughs> but it was actually pretty nice yesterday. It was cold for a bit, but I got to say the bombers, um, you know, you didn't have a parade for what Zach Claro said were reasons, which is, which is fine. But I think they made the most of, <laughs> of the situation yesterday. It was a very well done ceremony um, led by Bob Irving. They showed highlights on the screen, had a number of speakers but then it was the time for the main event, Huss, when they brought up the players. That's what everyone wanted to see. And, you know, they got driven around on trucks, saluting the fans, spraying them with champagne. Saw Big Hill handing out um, some of his equipment. Um, I thought it was, it was awesome. Um, you know, I, I think it sets a standard for what a celebration can be. Um, I saw someone, you know, I thought there was maybe like five to 10,000. I saw someone, I think Bob Irving said there was like 7,500. I would... I would agree with that. I thought that was uh, accurate, but I mean, some awesome pictures on the Bombers social media. I took one of the defensive backs, put it on our our Instagram. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, it was it was great here, and I'll just well, throw, throw them up. Remember now. yesterday? Yeah, you throw them up on YouTube while we're talking about this uh, for everyone that's uh, watching with us live or coming back later on to check the replay, which you can do, of course, anytime. And when you do get on the YouTube feed, just make sure you hit that red subscribe button, and uh, if you haven't already, hit that thumbs up button. Great to see everybody here. We talked yesterday, Remus, about, I mean, we were, obviously we all remember the parade and there was all sorts of all-star performances. Chris Strebler leading the way. Lucky Whitehead, a huge part of last year's celebration. And we speculated yesterday who were going to be the standout dudes of the 2021 Grey Cup celebration. And I had mentioned two guys that I was looking forward to seeing what they were bringing. One was Winston Rose. And number two was Sergio Castillo. And the question was, and I said this half jokingly, I wonder whether Castillo will show up with the uh, blue and gold Lucha Libra mask that he had been uh, you know, wearing in the locker room and tweeting out pictures. 
Well, Castillo didn't just show up in the Lucha Libra mask. He had a poncho on as well. I mean, if you didn't know who it was, there's the, <laughs> there's the picture. God, that's hilarious. He was having so much fun last night when he came out with the specialist. And there's a picture I put out on Insta as well with Sergio, who is still in the wrestling mask, still in the poncho. Willie Jefferson gave him the championship belt from uh, one of the Bombers super fans, L. Tony Tones, and then Willie J and uh, Sergio walked over to, I believe the section of the fans where Tony, the guy that actually got that belt made and normally wears it in games was. So um, Castillo was hilarious, had a great time and certainly stood out. But I gotta tell you, I mean, we've seen a lot of Bombers wearing those sweet blue Jets heritage throwback jerseys. Nick Dembski wore a Kyle Connor to the game. Uh, we saw Willie J earlier this season, the last couple of weeks, I believe, wearing a Blake Wheeler. And then it was Winston Rose last night looking resplendent in a Heritage Connor Hellebuck jersey last night, sort of stealing the show a little bit when he came out. Um, but man, whether it was the way he was rocking with the cop, the DBs were the first ones to kind of lead the way out when it came to the players getting into the uh, the truck to go around the field. Um there was, uh, I, I know we really have used the word swag a lot 10 years ago with the uh, the Swaggerville defense, which was uh, one of the best ever for the Bombers. Um, there was a hell of a lot of swag last night with the Grey Cup champs running it back, and Winston Rose was front and center, and hell, he should be. I mean, he had a monster game and a couple huge plays um, in addition to the coverage that he normally brings. We talk about that stop on the third and one and his assistance on the Adam Big Hill tackle inside the 10-yard line, another huge play in the game. But uh, overall, just an absolutely, a little chilly, but a really, really fun night, and you know, considering how much everyone's been dealing with over the last couple of years, I was texting with Marat and he asked me about how it was. And I said, it was just phenomenal. I mean, it was, I, I can't remember the last time I was in a place where everybody was so freaking happy. And um, the West final at the end was sort of maybe like that as we left, but that was like a marathon of endurance. This was a little different. This was a celebration. This was a party well-deserved for both the Bombers and their fans. And it's a night I think everyone that was there won't be forgetting anytime soon. Yeah, it was awesome. Uh, Christopher Med in chat said it looked like a wrestling intro. And here we have Zach Kolaris like walking <laughs> out in the, here, I'll play it again, walking out with like the, uh, the you know, fireworks. And uh, holding up the Grey Cup. I don't know why it keeps pausing, but whatever. Um, and the Grey Cup, um, absolutely incredible. So, uh, you know, some great pictures on social media from that. Uh, it was a great celebration. You know, they got fans got to do the O'Shea O'Shea chant uh, when he came out with his family on a truck. Um, Kyle Walters said going back to back to back uh, is possible. Walters was awesome. Yeah. Walt, you know what? Walters? And he said he wasn't going to speak for very long, and he didn't. But I got to say, Walters killed it with his, um, you know, he kind of welcomed the fans. He did a couple chants, gave a quick couple shout out, shouts out, and then said, uh, you know, last year or two years ago, we said we wanted to bring everybody back and do it again next year. It took a little longer, but we did it. And uh, I'm thinking... The plan is remains the same. Bring as many of these guys back as we can and be back here. I guess it wouldn't be a full year with the regular schedule with every come out. It would probably be in about 50 weeks. So that's the one good thing with the later CFL schedule, folks. You don't have to wait as long until next season to start. We will touch the schedule a little later on. But uh, who stood out to you, Reem? Anyone else that sort of caught your eye? I mean, I sort of called a shot about Winston Rose mm -hmm. and Sergio Castillo. I will say this. I thought Andrew Harris was having the time of his life. Um, and the throwback starter jacket and the, that like early '90s sweater that he had repping the Blue Bombers um, was all aw was awesome as well. But um, I mean, everything was great last night. That's what happens when you win a championship, especially a second consecutive one. Yeah, it was awesome to see them all. You know, have their moment uh, lifting the Grey Cup. What a fantastic trophy, uh, Andrew Harris. Uh, I agree that he's. I've seen him on Instagram on the. Um, on the what's called on like the vintage uh, resellers, these guys who get you know find yeah. all the vintage uh, clothing and stuff. And he's bought a number of vintage uh, bombers stuff. And yesterday was no different with him rocking the uh, the thing. And yeah, here he is drinking from from the gray cup there on the truck, and then pouring one uh, for Zach Claris as well. So 
Um, it was a great, great party, great celebration. Um, under the circumstances, uh, very, very well done. I mean, couldn't have a parade, but I thought this was um, this was pretty cool, uh, pretty cool too. So it was fun to be a part of. It certainly was. Manny Fran, hustler pressured me to go to IG Field. Well, I knew you wanted to go, Manny. I just thought that you know you should prioritize that. Now, the big question is, did your wife come? I mean, I know you were going to make sure she was cool with it, but I maintain that should be a family event. I mean, these Grey Cup Championship celebrations don't come around every year. Well, hopefully they will. They have the last two times they played a season, but we all remember how long it was before then. So uh, anyways, great to see everybody there. Um, great to see the Bombers there. And, uh, you know, once again, I just have to say um, to everyone from the top to the bottom of the organization, congratulations and well done. Um, this is This is the model franchise of the Canadian Football League right now. Um, and we as Bomber fans in coast to coast are the envy of fans across the Canadian Football League. Um, and it was a long time coming. And, you know, Wade Miller, um, you know, had some words at the beginning of the of the event. Um, very deservedly, I mean, is the guy that really started this complete turnaround, taken over whatever it was in 2013 when this team was as about as low as it could go. Um, Kyle Walters, the work that he's done putting this, this football team together piece by piece. Um, has been absolutely phenomenal. And I mean, I don't know what more we can say about Mike O'Shea. We've talked to players about Mike O'Shea. Uh, we've heard people close to my, the, the football team talk about the effect that he's had on it. But Remo, maybe the most um, the most fitting and telling little tidbit of media from last night wasn't anything that happened on the podium, wasn't anything that was going to be broadcast on the news or on the OB broadcast or you know, um, you know, from fans in, in the in the stands, it was it was a quiet moment after it all finished up, where Mike O'Shea and his wife are out there grabbing a few things and helping clean up the event after it was all done, lending a hand into the people that were putting it on. And by the way, big big shout out to the bomber organization and everyone that was involved in putting that on. Here's the bit right there. And, you know, I've seen a bunch of tweets, a bunch of tweets today uh, about it. Um, and, you know, again, you know, we'll talk to players about what Mike O'Shea means. And we all know the the, uh, the culture that he's instituted. Um, but this is a guy that, that talks the talk quietly, but walks the walk very loudly. And um, I'm not sure there's a better example of a guy and what he, and the sort of person that he is and why this team has been successful and the all hands on deck nature of doing whatever it takes to help the team. And uh, that was just a tiny little example of it last night, but I thought it was very fitting. Yeah. Shout out to uh, Joey Slattery from CTV for grabbing that clip, which uh, you might be say has gone, vi gone viral, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, I mean, everyone we've talked to, they love him. They love playing for him. And I mean, Michael Shea, I mean, when he was playing us, was he not the scariest player out there? The guy yeah. you absolutely did not want to go against. And uh, he's turned into a, a great coach, undefeated in Grey Cups as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, a lot of, you know, admiration from the players. You heard them chanting O'Shea, O'Shea. And, um, well, and then the, the fans, fans as well. All the fans were too. Yep. And he knew that would go. Just like, oh, please, no. I mean, just so modest, so humble. And I'll say the same thing about Bob Irving. Um, you know, Bob was out there in what may very well be. I mean, I'm sure there'll be some you know, maybe team celebrations or a dinner or something that Bob absolutely will be involved in. But I mean, as far as publicly, I think there's a very good chance that that was Bob Irving's final act as the voice of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers for over four decades. And what a what a great final day on the job um, to have hosting that event with all the fans that have grown up and listened to his calls throughout the year and, you know, to celebrate you know, one of the most special teams that, you know, he has, uh, he and we all have ever, have ever been around. So, uh, and I, I've got some great news for you folks. I know we've been talking about this for a while, wanted to wait till the end of the season, but I can tell you that the legendary Bob Irving himself is scheduled to come on WST. Uh, we hope it'll be tomorrow. If not, it'll be early next week. Um, and what a great way to uh, wrap up the season uh, with a visit from Bob to Winnipeg Sports Talk to both talk about the 2021 champs, this club, but also a uh, little bit more about his great career and uh, some of his greatest memories from Blue Bomber football calling it for all of this time. We yeah, will talk more Bombers. Sorry, go ahead. Rick. I was going to say, I see a lot of people in chat uh, fired up about that. Uh, I think that's the number one. You know, we get a lot of guest requests. Um, that's for sure. Like the number one we've gotten for 
for weeks now, and we kind of wanted to wait till the right time. And uh, I think after the Grey Cup win uh, is, is perfect timing. Yeah, no, exactly. So uh, very excited for that. So uh, well, hopefully it'll happen tomorrow. I don't want to guarantee it. There are a couple factors that that might affect it. We might have to do it next week, but I can tell you, uh, I was talking to Bob today, we will have him on the program. So for all of you that have been uh, waiting for Bob Irving to pop on Winnipeg Sports Talk, it's happening and it could not be happening at a better time coming off a back-to-back championship. Uh, we'll talk more, you know, we'll get a bit of a behind the scenes look at what's been going on around the Bombers for the last few days. And I can't wait for that. Ed Tate's going to join us in the second hour of the program. Um, but coming up next, we're going to talk more out of Tesh. We'll get a little bit of his thoughts on what we've got going into tomorrow night's game. But I do want to talk about his piece that's up right now on The Athletic. Um, and it really focuses on Mark Shifley and the premise and the title pretty much tells it all it's time to ask about mark shifley's ceiling as the jets franchise player so that's going to be coming up in just a moment um before we do that i want to give a big thank you to our friends at f apparel for jumping on board with winnipeg sports talk of course when f apparel um if you've ever had a suit made in winnipeg um you may have talked to andrew and the gang down there but they are winnipeg and the, the city and the province's leading area to get perfectly priced custom suits for men. I think we all know that every guy needs at least one suit that fits and looks great. I know we haven't been wearing them very much over the last two years, uh, but hopefully that is going to change going in. Uh, of course, you've got weddings, you've got grads, you've got all those things. Nobody does it better than F Apparel. Um, and their custom-made suits start at just $400. They've got far more stuff than just suits, though. Uh, custom dress shirts, winter jackets, peacoats and more, casual chinos, golf pants, untucked dress shirts, Shoes, ties, and accessories, you can literally get it all done there. And if you think that you might have a need for that and might want to nudge a, a special someone for a perfect Christmas present, F gift cards right now, up until Christmas, are 15% if you buy them online. So a $200 gift card will only cost you $170. Go to F Apparel, EPHapparel.com for more info, or you can uh, pop in and see them down at $190. Smith Street. Our friends at Vita Health are getting ready for the holidays. You know, many of you are planning or maybe are part of planning large holiday gatherings. Um, and if you want to, if you want to go local, um, Vita Health, has, you can order fresh, local, free roaming turkeys from Vita Health at 386 per pound. You got to order in store. The deadline is December 19th. Uh, but they've got also a ton of great organic, plant-based, gluten-free, and natural holiday fixings, too. Stuffing, cranberry sauce, baking supplies, peppermint-flavored marshmallows, eggnog, chocolate, and more. Of course, Vita Health the stock of Olympics' best selection of local organic, natural groceries, supplements, and beauty products, all at great prices. Seven Winnipeg locations, including the newest store in Linden Ridge, Linden Ridge. And you can find out more online at myvita. Dot CA. Um, and speaking of holiday gathering, um, you might want to get into and check out one of those coloring and water softeners. So you've got beautiful sparkling sinks, tubs, everything for holding. And of course, your glassware and dishes will never sparkle like they will after using that. But of course, there's much more to it uh, at Culligan Water uh, when it comes to softeners, filters, bottled water coolers for your family, drinking water systems, not to mention citywide water delivery services and commercial and industrial water products and solutions as well. Special for the month of December, your first three months of Culligan Water, only $9.99. You can give the gift of Culligan Water as well for $9.99 for three months. Give Keenan and the guys a call at 204-694-5180. Visit them at 1200 Sargent Avenue or find out more online at drinkculligan.com. All right, let's get going. Uh, Jets back in action tomorrow night taking on the Washington Capitals. Uh, but another disappointing performance, to say the least, on a Tuesday, a home loss to the Buffalo Sabres. Uh, and a couple days off gives uh, a lot of people time to talk about topics outside of just the game. And we're going to do just that with Murat Atesh coming up right now. Murat of The Athletic. You can follow him on Twitter at WPG Murat. And if you're not already subscribing to The Athletic, that should be on your Christmas list for yourself heading into the holiday season. Murat, how are you? Hey, I'm doing well, Huss. How are things? Uh, things are great. Great night last night. 
celebrating with Winnipeg fans, ton of people. I was just, you know, th those sort of celebrations, I mean, don't come around very often. So when you come into a place that even if it's a little bit cold, everyone is just so freaking happy. Uh, it, it, it's just, I mean, it gives you a, a special buzz. We saw a ton of listeners and viewers last night. So uh, overall, it was a uh, it was a great night, which was a nice change from the way many of those same people felt leaving the arena or finishing watching Tuesday's game involving the local hockey squad. Yeah, and you know what? That's a beautiful segue. I'm going to stomp all over it because I don't get a chance to talk CFL very much. I'm not a I'm not as dialed in. I certainly don't know the analytics or the 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 X's and O's, but. I do know, and I do get the sense from watching you, from talking to Darren Bombing, from talking to to Zach, uh, you know, with Bombers fans as well. Like there is a special connection that the Winnipeg Blue Bombers have with their with their fans. I was gonna say with their people, um, and it's been fun to just kind of vicariously watch those photos that you put up, that Remus have put up, that have been around the internet. Like that's fun. Congratulations to Winnipeg, I should say, on that one. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it's it's a special team, it's a special group of guys, and it's something that, and I don't know if you can ever put a finger on it, whether it started in a particular place, whether it was Jamarcus Harder jumping into the stands after touchdowns of an old lineman doing it for some of the events, or maybe just the aftermath of winning in 2019. But there really is a connection between this city and the fans of this football team that is reciprocated from the team and the players, unlike any that I've seen before. And, uh, you know, then when you can have the success that they've had on the field, it creates uh, weeks like this past one and nights like last night. And one that, um, you know, that we all dream of having something like that for the hockey team going forward. <laughs> and I will say that, Marat, to segue back to the pucks. Um Holy smokes. We'll get to your piece in a minute, but just what did you think about their, uh, Tuesday's game? I mean, it was another one of those games where they're playing against an opponent that straight up is not as good as them. There were times where they looked like they were just dominating the game, toying with them at times. And then you sort of watch this third period with not a lot of life in the building, not a lot of life in the team, not a lot of pushback after falling down. And it's another regulation loss uh, to a team that when you look at the schedule, there's I know they're all NHL players you got to take everybody seriously but I mean that's a game you just have to have when you're in the middle of a dogfight with 10 or 11 teams on the edge of a playoff spot in the west 100 percent. that is the game that the Winnipeg Jets have to have it's an effort that has to be better than it was and I personally thought and this is even in the early going when Winnipeg was picking Buffalo apart. Um, for example, Kyle Connor gains his own, doubles back, fires through a perfect seam to, to Mark Shifley. Uh, one timer opportunity. Uh, Buffalo's goalie, whose name I can't pronounce, gets the pad out. You almost saw Shifley celebrating before the, the the puck goes in because it was such a good scoring chance. And Kyle Connor, in particularly, I thought was kind of going globetrotters on the Buffalo defense early on in that game. Um, maybe not the first couple of shifts. There were some issues exiting the zone for a lot of Jets. But even during that period when things were going well, there was a softness to Winnipeg's game. There was a chance creation through one flavor only to Winnipeg's game. And I don't think that it was as committed of an all-around offensive game, even as the scoring chance numbers might suggest, though they probably generate enough to deserve better than two goals. The thing that, bug, that bugged me the most about that game, though, is when things didn't go their way, when that pond hockey style of game didn't turn into goals and didn't turn into a lead, their defensive game just fell apart, just fell apart. And, you know, for example, you have that one shift that leads to Buffalo's second goal where Christian Veselainen um, and his line mates uh, on what was then Winnipeg's third line, I believe, depending on the shuffling of the day, uh, were, were caught out for a really long defensive zone shift. They get it into the offensive zone. Everybody's able to change, but Veselainen. Shifley's line comes out. Kyle Connor's there. Andrew Kopp's the one forward who isn't able to get back out. Uh, the defense has changed. DeMello and Beaulieu have gone off, and now you have Morrissey and Schmidt. So presumably you have four out of five guys are are, are happy, healthy, energized, um, and they've, they've completely recovered. Buffalo takes the puck into their zone, gets a step on the Jets to be sure. That's fine. Winnipeg falls into its man-to-man -man defense, as is just fine in that scenario. Um, but then it just falls apart. Josh Morrissey chases his man up high, which is allowed. That's part of the program when Winnipeg's in a man-to-man -man formation. Nate Schmidt follows his man to the corner. Same deal. That's allowed. But you know what that leaves is the net front. Kyle Connor is there. He doesn't pick up on the guy that's over his shoulder. But where's your center on that play? Mark Shifley is high in the zone. And not only does he 
not have his man, he's on the wrong side of Vinny Hinestroza, high in the zone, so that the pass that gets made for that second goal is made for free. So Kyle Connor looks the worst mm-hmm. because he's beside the guy that scores. The defensemen look pretty bad because they're not on like on camera in the slot. But then you've got your centerman sort of absconding his duties on that situation as well. And I think that that's the kind of goal that's emblematic of Winnipeg at its worst when they get hopeful, when they get wishful, when they come off the game that actually leads to success. Because if Winnipeg plays halfway good committed defense against the Buffalo Sabres mm-hmm. and generates chances, it wins that hockey game. There's no doubt about it. And, you know, it was funny. I mean, I was at the game and I'm kind of checking on my phone and seeing what you and some of the folks in the press box are saying. And like 30 seconds after I heard it, two rows behind me, I saw you tweet it out. This is looking like Arizona part two. And, uh, (laughs) and, you know, in a lot of ways it was. I mean, you're playing a completely undermanned team that probably on most given nights, certainly talent-wise, has no business being in that sort of a dogfight with them. We've seen a team that, you know, at times was controlling the play and doing what they wanted to do. Um, But, you know, you have to earn these wins in the National Hockey League. And sometimes you couldn't help but think that it was just expecting it was going to happen. And when you expect things to happen, you don't pay attention to the details that actually help you win hockey games. And that example you just rolled out was a perfect example of a lack of attention to detail and the little things that a coach, I know people want to kill the coach, that the coach is not teaching them to do that. I will tell you that and spoke about it afterwards. And it can be incredibly frustrating for all parties involved. But at the end of the day, it comes down to very simple execution of basic things that were probably talked about on the first day of training camp. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Winnipeg knows its system better than it played it on that goal. And it was a sluggish game from the opening minutes where Winnipeg just choked on its zone entries so many times. And there's a particularly bad zone exits, pardon me, getting the buck out of their zone. There's a particularly clumsy one from Evgeny Sveshnikov that was one of my first real, "Uh uh-oh, this is going to be a night sort of moments. And it sort of continued like that. So it wasn't one isolated incident. I think that goal illustrates it well. But if you're Paul Maurice looking at how your players play on that, um, you know, after the game, he says, well, you can't abandon the front of your net and expect to have a good time. Well, exactly right. And I I can only imagine how frustrated he would have been in that situation. Um, At the same time, you know, those are some of his best players. Four out of his five, you know, that's his top defensive pairing and two thirds of his top line at that moment. Maybe Andrew Cobb's the defensive conscience that would have made that read. Veselina was so exhausted. We'll see. but I, I wonder then where where you go from that moment. And then, you know, the the players in question, Mark Shifley ends up playing 25 minutes. I guess I'm, I'm, I'm really talking about this. You know, it's part of the subject of my piece. And I just feel like in that moment where things aren't going well and when your best players aren't being your best players, at least at one end of the rink, you know, I wonder what Maurice's options were to go from zero to try to get things going we saw some line shuffling in the third period i like that he played some offensive players on the pk late in the game when they were chasing and that includes shifley as well um and, and i think that kyle connor was out there for that andrew Kopp, adam lowry got aggressive there's some some nice things but i don't know that uh that last chunk of the game chasing against the buffalo sabers who are about to win their second game in account like in a month uh is is really quite the response to a team that's not executing the game plan as drawn up. No doubt. Um, you know, and I hate to get, get because listen, I'm as guilty maybe as anyone more because I'm very emotionally invested in all of this. I own it. Um, you know, I was miserable for those days coming out of that Arizona game. And we had some conversations that maybe are some of the ones that, you know, you'll have with a friend over a beer. Um, but, you know, it, it was an interesting week in talking with you and with Ken on specifically about the big picture of the Winnipeg Jets. And if you're looking at changing things, what, what what changes are going to actually take this team from a team with a lot of talent and a lot of potential to one that is a, uh, you know, is more consistent um, and gets the most out of all of its parts. And I know everyone will start off with the coach. Obviously, that is a conversation for Kevin Sheveldayoff and Mark Chipman if they think that there's someone else that can do a better job. Um, But it's a unique situation. They seem to be really married together. And if you take for a moment going away from a simple coaching change, which history has told us is the easiest thing to do because it's much harder to, you know, change players or change things and change cultures, that that really is the leader. 
Um, then there's other things that we that we talked about. And we finally, for the first time, talked about Mark Scheifele far into his NHL career as who is this player? Is he the franchise guy going forward? Is that the guy that's going to lead you to the promised land? Um, and is that the guy that's going to be your number one? And it's so different now with Pierre-Luc Dubois in town playing the way that he's playing, pushing Mark Scheifele. And to many people, at least if you just watched this season, I would say there's definitely an argument that he has surpassed Mark Scheifele in effectiveness as a 200-foot player, as a number one center, as a better option to go up against those top players. And we dug into it a little bit more. Um, and, and, you know, it was fascinating reading what you wrote today in The Athletic, kind of thinking back to some of those conversations a couple of weeks ago with what we've seen since. Now with the absence of Blake Wheeler, the captain of this team, Mark Scheifele's always been sort of thought as the next man up, as the guy that, I'll be honest, I was hoping to see Mark Scheifele look like a captain on Tuesday night. And being a guy that, you know, without Wheeler there, said, hey, we're going to be fine and lead the way with a strong game. And unfortunately, it wasn't even close to that. Dismal at times, you laid it out, and it does beg the question, you know, going forward with this same group and leaning on Mark Scheifele far more than Pierre-Luc Dubois, as we talked about, is that the recipe for success? And if that's not, as an organization and as a head coach, what are the moves going forward to get better results in the short term if you're not changing personnel? Yeah, I mean, Winnipeg is a playoff contender based on the roster they have. They were probably going to be a cup contender for as long as Blake Wheeler was elite and Mark Scheifele was becoming elite as well. Blake Wheeler is a little bit past his elite prime and still contributing. I love that game he had when he got hurt, but certainly that wasn't indicative of his full season. Mark Scheifele hasn't become elite because his offense is so good. Hockey is a game of what you create versus what you give up. He gives up so much defensively that it's tough to imagine a championship where he's playing 25 minutes a night like he did the other day. And I remember this was, you know, in Seattle where he's back checking on what's a one on one with uh, Nate Schmitz defending a, a, a Kraken player, a Kraken. Uh, and Jamie Oleksiak is trying to jump into that play to make it a two on one. Mark Scheifele's back checking through the neutral zone. He has a step on Oleksiak and then stops. Oleksiak turns it into a two on one. It becomes a scoring chance. And I, I remember thinking to myself in that moment that this is not a one off. This is endemic of Mark Scheifele's play where it's wishful. He plays defense like it, like he believes somebody else will win the puck and move it in the other direction. And that would be okay if he scored like Connor McDavid or Leon Dreisaitl do. Even then you'd want more defense from that. So then how do you get this player who has at times shown that commitment? You know, against Edmonton for most of that playoff series, I thought he was really good. And, you know, earlier in his career, I thought that there was a little bit more commitment. So it's there. The ability is there. He makes such smart reads all over the offensive zone. I don't think he's getting blindsided in the D zone. I, I genuinely do think that defense is a choice and a decision and a commitment level that he has not um, decided to make often or consistent and consistently enough this season. So then how do you improve? How do you take the team that relies on him so much uh, and, and improve? If it's not a snap your fingers and he's a complete Ryan O'Reilly type player, well, then there's got to be something else. And for me, it starts with minutes distribution. He's averaging two minutes extra compared to Pierre-Luc Dubois at five on five uh, every single night this season. Um, now that they're sharing a power play unit, that, uh, their total ice time should get a little bit closer together, but two minutes difference when Pierre-Luc Dubois has outscored him uh, at five on five, plays a more complete 200 foot game. You know, I think that that's an area where it really needs to come off. And another, you know, a time period when Winnipeg was winning this season was when Shifley, Wheeler and Lowry were Winnipeg's third line. And that's an interesting one to me because I don't think you want to play Shifley that far down the lineup. However, hmm. Blake Wheeler is a pretty committed defensive player. Uh, Adam Lowry is an excellent one. And I think that one of the ways that you may cover off for Shifley's lack of commitment defensively is to like partner him with somebody who is absurdly committed. And that's your Adam Lowry type player. And that's whether Adam Lowry is a center, Shifley's the right wing. Otherwise, you know, you can you can um, to have two centermen on a line is another sort of workaround for that. And I think that 
if there is transformation in how Winnipeg rolls things out, and certainly you see a, an attempt at balance with Stastny, Shifley, Ehlers, um, and then you have Connor Dubois and Sveshnikov back together, Kopp and Lauer reuni- reunited, they're looking for balance. And I'm imagining that results and performance need to be tied to what happens on the ice. And I thought that Shifley and Connor to a degree as well were awful on that second goal. Then they go play 20 plus minutes and Dubois lagging behind Shifley six minutes behind. Well, if you're trying to create a culture of winning or a culture of accountability, Hmm. when a guy plays like that, uh, he's got to see the bench a little bit more frequently uh, than simply having it trotted out. So perhaps a reduction in Shifley, an increase in Dubois. And certainly, you know, if you're looking for opportunities, and maybe that was the purpose of having Cop on that line, you got to you gotta cover for him. You, have, you need to have teammates covering for this defensive performance that simply isn't there. You know, uh, <laughs> you mentioned that word accountability. And listen, n- none of it really happens publicly. I mean, almost, I mean, very, very rarely do you hear, um, I mean, you know, Paul Stastny was pretty, Frank, last year when things were getting ugly at the end of the season, you know, with maybe a bit of a come to God moment that actually happened outside. I have no idea what happens behind the scenes. I'm sure it's very different than what we get. And certainly from Paul Maurice's standpoint, he is a guy, um, you know, some coaches decide to, you know, let guys have it publicly and let everyone know that, yeah, I'm seeing the same thing that you guys are. That's not the case here. But I, I do wonder, and I was thinking about this and talking about it with some people during the third period of the game. Seeing Chai that line being rolled out over and over again and kind of looking at, you know, where the heck is Dubois? He'd been the guy that had scored, had an assist, was definitely the Jets' best player on the ice. And I got thinking, you know, from a team perspective, from the guys outside of that top line, I mean, what do those decisions do to the mental psyche of a team that, you know, I'll tell you what, I mean, if you're on the fourth line or if you're on the third line and you make a terrible giveaway or make a real gaffe, you, <laughs> there's no hesitation to... uh take a seat and allow the guys that are making things happen, get out there a little bit more. It just, it, it, see, it has always seemed to me, and I've joked around for a long time that the Winnipeg Jets have sort of run their operation like a union shop. It hasn't always been that case, but it, it doesn't seem to be. And maybe part of it is the game. I get it. You're trying to win a game. If you want to get a goal, Mark Shifley is right at the top of the list of guys that will be able to do that for you. Um, but you cited it in, in your article. I mean, there was it last year where he got benched on a hockey night in Canada, in, in Toronto. I mean, very rarely have you seen Paul Maurice take steps like that. And it's just, listen, I'm not saying bench the entire team. I mean, that was a very winnable game. Or bench the entire line or have Mark Shifley sit for the third period. I am saying, though, if I'm Pierre-Luc Dubois and I'm playing like the way that I am right now, like in that game with Nikolai Ehlers and you're going and generating and then you're seeing the shifts and the length of shifts and realizing that, you know, when the chips are down, it's still always going to those other guys. I'd be wondering it myself. And I'd imagine guys elsewhere in the lineup were kind of wondering too, like, you know, are there different rules for different guys on this team? And I think you can make an argument that there are. Yeah, I would agree with that interpretation. And just a a quick note on what, one of the first things that, that you said, um, I would not be surprised if Mark Shifley's teammates are fully aware of the difference in accountability in that situation. I absolutely would not. And that would be that would that would cast a strange light on on a player's own situation and own decisions. Um, wherever you are in the lineup, whether you're Pierre-Luc Dubois is the one player that's driving, you know, Nick Ehlers had a good game too, but Dubois was your absolute driver that night. Or even further down the lineup. I mean, for example, you know, now we have Jackson Harkins, David Gustafson, and Christian Veselainen on that fourth line. If they get in there on a, have a really great forechecking shift or two, and then play four and a half minutes at the end of the night, I mean, you're going to question your your place in in the NHL as well. So, you talk about this union shop mentality, and you talk also about, you know, of course you're going to chase the game. Uh, I, I guess, what am I trying to say on this? I get that. I get that it's a good play to get Shifley on the ice when you're trying to create a goal late in the game. But at the same time, we have an eight and a half year coach here and there is an element of sustainable winning, right? We talk about the process. If a team's out chancing the other team, well, sometimes goaltending happens, sometimes bounces happen, but you, you eventually, as long as the process is good, teams start to win games. I wonder if a long-term view on Mark Shifley would be a reduction in minutes. And the actual first thing that you said, 
is that he Paul Maurice doesn't torch his players in the media. Benchings are rare. I respect that. I absolutely do. Like I, I am under no illusions that Paul Maurice believes Mark Scheifele has played a complete 200 foot game this season. I asked him about it today. The answer was relatively short. Uh, he he cited one play against Vancouver that wasn't particularly good. Anyway, it, like he's not going to torch his player. Mm-hmm. I respect that, and I believe that players respect and admire that as well. I think that that's a in Winnipeg an advantage. That is a smart play and and uh, full full value to Paul Maurice for it. It would be nice though to see in the actual what we can see publicly and observe that matters that ice time distribution accountability comes there and you don't have to go from 25 minutes a night to zero because Mark Shifley does help you win games. I hope that's not lost in, in, in this. It's just that he could help you win an awful lot more with more defensive commitment and it's in him somewhere. It's not coming out and it hasn't come out consistently for some time. Meanwhile, you have these other players who should be taking those minutes. And at first it was Nikolai Ehlers and now it's Pierre-Luc Dubois. And like in that middle six group of, of NHL Jets hierarchy, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if there is frustration. I believe that there probably would be. You know, uh, being a head coach in the National Hockey League is not an easy job. And, you know, there are the things that, you know, fans will talk about, you know, the the systems and, and you know, certainly you know, your special teams, which has been a major issue. And I think something that is a bit of an anvil when it comes to the coaching staff right now. When you know, if you're if you're one of the people that are trying to say, hey, this is not about coaching. Um, and then you look at these special teams numbers, it's a difficult, difficult argument to make right now um, because I don't think there's many people that wouldn't say that coaching, leadership, this sort of design behind the plays doesn't have a big part of success, especially when things are su- are struggling and trying to change it around. But I also realize that Paul Maurice is a very smart man. He's an incredible communicator. He's been around for a long time, and he has maybe been the greatest when it comes to self-preservation. Um, I mean, just look at the numbers. I mean, John Cooper's the longest serving. He's got a couple cups. The next guy is Paul Maurice. And I think part of it early on was realizing that if he's going to be the head coach, they've got Mark Shifley signed to this eight-year deal. He is their superstar. He is their number one center. That line is going to be the team that, you know, makes or breaks it. And they did it very well in 17-18. And we will all remember, like, the height of Shifley's career, 14 goals in 17 playoff games, leading the team past Nashville, all of that. But it, it really does seem, from the outside at least, that over the course of the last couple seasons where things took a real dive since then, um, everything has been modeled to make the number one center and the guys in the leadership group as happy as possible. And it's sort of being about them. And at times people have thought that there was kind of two, two rooms, if you will, there was the guys at the top that doesn't matter what they do. They're going to be rolled out there and they're going to be the guys that get the ice time. They're going to be the guys that are on the power play and so on and so forth. And then a bunch of other guys that are sort of picking it up. And as we get to a point where you have a deeper team, I mean, the one thing that I've always wanted to see is some more legitimate competition and i think we now have certainly the players to i mean if you look at the jets top six right now you'll well i'll tell you who i think the number one line is and it's not the line with mark shifley on it right now we'll see whether that comes out when who goes over the boards who's playing against ovechkin on the weekend you know all of those things going forward but i think so much of it has been and again there's no real way to prove it but i think we just say the proof is in the pudding look at what's happened the last few years and despite some time i mean you mentioned that one game in toronto and it seemed like maurice was pulling that out at one point to say hey wake up like i need more from you right now and it sort of did tur- did turn from there but big picture especially with uh, blake wheeler who i think as much as he's taken some heat from fans honestly i believe is the conscience of that line and maybe of that room, although there's some new leaders emerging, if um, if that continues to just be the same as it will be, I'm not sure the results are different, at least for that group. Because to your point, if this team wants to take that next step, Mark Scheifele is always going to be able to score. But it is commitment to some of the less sexy things that helped you win games that you absolutely need your player. If they're playing number one minutes in that number one role, you'd need more out of them. And man, you dug into some of the numbers in the piece Marat. And um, to be honest, they are ugly. Yeah. I mean, put it in a numerical context over the last, you know, from 2018, 19 to now amongst NHL centers, he's playing 
the third most even strength minutes. So Paul Maurice is leaning on him more than Austin Matthews gets leaned on, than Sidney Crosby gets leaned on, than Patrice Bergeron gets leaned on, um, on a team which has, at times, not had tremendous center depth. Certainly they do right now with Pierre-Luc Dubois in the fold. So that's an interesting one. Okay, well, if he's top 10, top 5 in, in ice time, well, let's look at the results, right? We know he's... I believe that Mark Scheifele is one of the best offensive players on the planet. I don't think I need to prove that to anybody. He sees plays other people don't. Um, that's there. But then if he's creating such dangerous plays all of the time and he's playing with such good players and Connor Hellebuck is his goaltender, then shouldn't he drive goal differential? Shouldn't Mark Scheifele be on the ice for a disproportionate amount of goals for compared to against? Well, at five on five over the last three years, I think he's at plus four right now, if I recall what I wrote correctly. Um, he's outside the top 50, not just of NHL players, but of NHL centermen in, in this three-year span as well. And that is, I mean, plus four, plus, plus 11 if you count three on three and four on four and all of that stuff too. That's better than zero. It's better than minus. You can say that that player has slightly helped you win games whilst playing against top competition. But Mark Shively is capable of so much more than that and a top center that gets played the third most even strength minutes should give you so much more than that where however it gets done um i bu- i have time for players that are offense first as long as they're outscoring their problems to an extreme degree mark shifley hasn't demonstrated that but like we know goals based evidence of or evaluation pardon me of of a of a player with shifley's offensive ability and I genuinely believe that you can add, like Micah McCurdy does a great job of this at Hockey Viz, measure the quality of chances that he creates. They are genuinely better than average. Shots taken by players shooting when Mark Scheifele has set them up are more dangerous than for other players. So if you have that going for you, you have Connor Hellebuck going for you, goals-based evaluation is the best you'll ever look. And as a matter of fact, if you go into scoring chances, if you go into um, evolving hockey's, for example, of even strength defense model, which compares the quantity and quality of chances that a player is on the ice for, uh, runs it through a reg- reg- regression, pardon me, um, to 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 sort out line mates so that we're looking at Shifley's chances against compared to who he plays with, who he plays against, all those sorts of things. Well, Mark Shifley isn't in the top 50 NHL centers uh, for that. Either, as a matter of fact, I think he has the fourth worst even strength defense in the entire National Hockey League. And you might be able to explain that away if he played four minutes a night. The sample's all weird. If he'd barely gotten to 200 five-on-five minutes so far this season, well, he's well over 400. And that's the kind of uh, sample size where these numbers actually begin to have a little bit of credence. Some of it is results-based. Some of it is based on... um, you know, luck can play a factor, not at that sort of sample size, not as much anyway. Uh, certainly the goaltending hasn't been crazy horrible behind him. His fin- like the percentages don't say anything. He plays slightly more offensive zone shifts than defensive zone shifts. He's not get asked to do the heavy lifting, like disproportionately heavy lifting in terms of the other contextual factors. So then you want more. You just want more from a player with that much ability. Oh, there's no doubt about it. Murat Atesh with us from The Athletic. Folks, check out the piece today in The uh, in the Athletic. It just dropped this morning. It's called It's Time to Ask About Mark Shifley's Ceiling as the Jets Franchise Player. Let's get to going into tomorrow night because coming out of that game, um, the blender, maybe a new blender for Paul Maurice, uh, but it went back to a couple familiar looks. And it is interesting that Kyle Connor is now back with Pierre-Luc Dubois and Svechnikov moving up. This was the line that was having a lot of success before the swap of Wheeler and Svechnikov and then a number of changes over the course of the past month. And Nikolai Ehlers back with Mark Shifley. Yeah, let's just focus in on the top six. What do you make of the changes? And uh, how do you think that those two lines will be deployed? Because um, you know a big part of Shifley being out as much as he was, I think, in that game was the fact that he'd been playing with Kyle Connor, who has been Winnipeg's most dangerous offensive player and they needed goals. They're not together anymore. Yeah, I think that it's a reflection of who's working right now. And so Kyle Connor 
um, with Dubois and Svechnikov. I like the way that Kenny listed that out. I see your graphic right now. They, they're listed as the number one line. I'm not sure that we'll see the minutes play out like that because of Shifley's spot in the in the pecking order. But Connor and Dubois have been going. They've been a dangerous combination all season long. Even you split them up, they're the dangerous ones. They're the ones that can create. And the other night, Nick Ehlers would belong in that group as well. Now you've sort of split them up, a, a split Ehlers away from them. You've promoted Svechnikov. I guess what that is, is it's looking for a rejuvenation of that of that offense against anybody balance, where Svechnikov isn't going to be the most dangerous player on that line. And sometimes he defers a little bit much to those other two players, uh, in in my opinion, for you know, uh, for the for the best outcome part of me. But we saw success with that group, and we saw them play a relatively good 200-foot game, Dubois especially, and generate against just about anyone. I think that that is a viable top six line. You don't have to worry about the matchups against. Uh, Paul Stastny will be the defensive conscience on the Shifley and Ehlers line for sure. Uh, not only because he is prob- probably makes the best reads and has the most commitment in the defensive zone. It's his experience as a center as well. He, you know, a superior faceoff person to, to Mark Shifley through most of their careers as well. There's a lot to like about him fitting. I think that his job will be defensive conscience, although he's made some really nice passes in the, and, and and generated turnovers in the last little while. I think he's on a, on a mini heater as well. Shifley and Ehlers will look to create offense. And the interesting thing is we don't see a lot of Shifley and Ehlers together. That 2018-2019 season, they played a whole bunch. Uh, it was Shifley, Ehlers, and Wheeler, and they destroyed their competition. They outscored their opposition by a mile. The Connor version of the line didn't during that season, but you didn't see them stick together. And I think that one of the reasons is stylistic. I mean, Ehlers is a little bit tougher for Shifley to predict. Ehlers goes wide and um, you know takes these wide arcs through through the offensive zone and then doubles back, whereas Connor is a little bit more of a straight line player and. And he has a sense of timing, I think, Kyle Connor off the puck that Shifley really appreciates. Well, I think that we're going to look for Shifley and Ehlers to create a certain type of chemistry now. For me, that's your third most, I think that's your third best line from a defensive standpoint. Um, and and probably the matchup shouldn't be as severe for them if you're Paul Maurice. And then you get to Coplauer and Tony Nato, and that's where you get Ovechkin as far as I'm concerned. I mean, you've reunited mm-hmm. your two defensive towers for a purpose and I have to believe that it's for playing against one of the world's best offensive players still, somehow still, in Alexander Ovechkin. Yeah, and, and, and you know, I mean, I, I think a lot has been made of the uh, lack. Uh, the third line had never really found itself so far this year. I mean, we certainly hadn't seen some of the offensive contributions that we had in the past when those guys were together, especially with Mason Appleton last year, who I thought as a group they really were effective and and Paul Maurice played them as such. I mean, they got more minutes in a regular third line because of how important that they were. Um, so I'm looking for it. I think Toninato certainly has earned an opportunity to get a look, but I think the key of getting Cop and Lowry back together will be significant going into this weekend. And then, of course, we've got the fourth line. And I got to tell you, I mean, David Gustafson, the Gus bus is here, along with Jansen Harkins and uh, Christian Veselainen. These guys have all played plenty of time with the Manitoba Moose. I think we've said this is this is the Jets' model of developing players and sometimes over-ripening them. Anyone that's watched the Moose this year has seen David Gustafson saying, I am ready. Um, what do you make of that combination? And uh, what do you hope, I mean, from a Jets' perspective, what are the hopes that Gus will be able to bring to this lineup when he makes his debut for this season tomorrow night? Well, I kind of want to couch all of this in, you know, there was a Twitter response to me posting that line that was well yeah you'll probably get two shifts in the first period two shifts in the second period and one shift in the third you know i'm not sure that that will literally be true but you're probably not going to see a lot of minutes from those guys and that's the disappointing part because what i think you would like to see from them and probably will see from them is a tremendous amount of energy a tremendous amount of it david gustafson is you know counted on by the moose in all three situations, big minutes of five on five, such a responsible player. He plays a 200 foot game at that level, um, can play in the in the crease, on the boards, win battles in those situations, move the puck up ice. He's also good in transition and good offensively. I mean, with Cole Perfetti at the World Junior Camp, I believe Gustafson remains uh, Manitoba's highest scoring player as of the moment. So... That's a player that can do a little bit of everything. He's faster than you'd remember him from back in his first Jets tour of duty a couple of seasons back. He's stronger. He's smarter. His confidence with the puck is even greater. Jansen Harkins, you can count on him to skate almost almost like Tanev with a certain sense of chaos. There's a lot of speed there. Uh, there are times when, you know, the... You know, he was a playmaker and a really dominant offensive player at the AHL level. I'm not sure that we've seen that 
inconsistent spurts, but the ice time has been a factor as well. Christian Veselainen, um, there have been moments where you see him forecheck particularly well, but I think I continue to wonder about what his ceiling is at the NHL level because he's got that shot. He has moments of that aggression. And then there are moments where he's just late to the seam. He can't get in position to use that shot. That's so amazing on that fourth line with all three guys kind of at that same spot in their careers, trying to establish themselves, trying to prove that they're NHL players, despite whatever AHL minutes or or low fourth line minutes they've played recently. I think you're going to get the best and most energetic out of all of those guys. And we'll probably have a lot of fans and observers and analysts too, wondering why they only played five minutes and change at the end of, uh, at the end of Friday night, let's say. Uh, Murata Tesh with us. Hey, before we go, um, you know, coming off a tough loss, you've got a very good Washington team coming in this weekend and then an afternoon game in the division against the St. Louis Blues. And I know we're not even at the halfway point right now. When you look at the last month for the Jets after a really strong start, a lot of those gains earlier that were made have sort of been burned, especially with some of these bad losses at home. What are you looking for in particular when they drop the puck tomorrow night and maybe looking at this weekend as a whole for the Winnipeg Jets? Yeah, for me, it's about process. And the reason I say that, like, it's easy to look at the standings and they're outside that wild card spot, right? They have given up that hot start and have fallen down the standings. It was the five game losing streak. It was the, and then a 500 stretch of play win loss, win loss just about since that time. That's really given that up. And, you know, because the Buffalo game was so bad, there's a temp, it's, and because of where they are in the standings, it's probably tempting to be very doom and gloom about this team right now. I happen to think that their process during most of that five-game losing streak was pretty good and not the sort of thing that would set off five alarm bells in my mind. The Buffalo game was awful, and I I know they outchanced the opposing team, but there was just a level of play that Winnipeg did not get to. And so what I'm looking for, win or loss, because like you say, Washington's a very good team, St. Louis within the division as well, we need to see the team play that commitment to protecting the puck down low, to offering multiple breakout options to players down low and up high. Because Winnipeg, when it's moved the puck well up the ice, there's been puck support down low. There's been puck support and options you know, higher up as well. And the Winnipeg's defensemen have been able to make those plays by and large. So what you would want, I think, is that 200-foot game. If Mark Shively's playing defense in the slot and, and below the goal line and committed to that and stays below his man until the puck gets out of Winnipeg zone, well, that's a line that's going to beat his competition. However, the balances come out. You're looking for a re- rejuvenated Pierre-Luc Dubois, Kyle Connor, Evgeny Svechnikov trio as well. And you're looking for Kopp Lowry and um, Antonio Nato to win the possession game, however the goals go. If they get those things right, I believe that the scoring chances will come. I believe the goals will come. I believe Connor Hellebuck will be Connor Hellebuck. And even if they don't beat Washington on Friday night, if Alexander Ovechkin sets a power play goal scoring record, perhaps, um, as long as the flow of play and the commitment is there, the horses are in place to have a successful season. Still, you just need a night and day change from what happened against Buffalo. Yeah, well, we can just only hope that uh, I I remember all the doom and gloom coming out of the Arizona game. We had the three days off in between games and, you know, kind of went in and said, well, eh, who knows? Maybe the team will just rattle off a couple wins and we'll show up on the weekend. Everyone in a great mood. That's exactly what happened. So uh, fingers crossed we uh, get a great performance from the Jets tomorrow night. And in particular with those top two lines, the way they are, um, would be great to see Dubois and Connor sort of pick up where they left off together. And, and, you know, get a real battle between those two lines in the eyes of the head coach that hopefully make each other better, make each other more accountable and bring out the best in both of those uh, of those um, units in the top six will be so important. Murat, thanks so much for doing this. This is a great chat, folks. Get to The Athletic right now and read the article if you haven't. And uh, Murat, have an awesome weekend. Enjoy the games and we'll talk to you next week. Thank you. Love it. Thanks so much, us. Great. Uh, at WPG Murat. Marata Tesh of The Athletic. Uh, the piece was up this morning. Go there, get there. And if you haven't already subscribed to The Athletic, what the heck are you waiting for? Um, hey, I, we've got a, uh, our friends over at Manitoba Battery getting ready into the last minute Christmas season. Uh, for all of you shoppers who have avoided the malls for this holiday season and want to continue to do so, but still need to get your Christmas shopping done. How about giving your loved one a gift that will keep them safe and running and save you from having to drive to your loved one's rescue? 
when they are, their car won't start and it's minus 30 outside. Right now, Manitoba Battery has heavy grade 20 foot 2GU 500 amp booster cables on for only $69.50 when you pick them up or they'll even bring them to you for an extra 10 bucks at $79.50. And of course, everything and anything about vehicle batteries and all your battery needs is a good add-on. Uh, and as you can see on the screen, they've got batteries for literally everything, including snowmobile season, about $65 to $75 on those. Give Donnie and the guys a call, 783-8787. Pop down and see him at 1026 Logan Avenue or find out more online at manitobabattery.com. All right, Bomber fans, we're going to talk to Ed Tate in a few minutes, but I can confirm to you, I just got a text from Greg over at Royal and uh, the championship gear is coming in hot and heavy. Earlier today, we've got, okay, Remus has got some of these picks right now. Beautiful. The champion's hats, the back-to-back -back Grey Cup champions t-shirts, three different models. A very cool Grey Cup 2021 hoodie. Tons of hats coming in. A number of different models. And some that I do know are unique to Royal Sports as well. So get ready. The gear is coming in right now. If you want to get it hot off the press, it is there today. They're literally putting it out on shelves as we speak. And uh, coming up on the weekend, you'll have a great chance to go in there, get all your bomber gear, and take care of all of your Christmas shopping for the sports fans, including bomber gear, jet gear, licensed merchandise from around the world of sports, not to mention hockey, snowboard, and so much more to, to get to, not to mention all the cool stuff on the Royal, on the Kings, skate, snow, and surf side. Uh, and our friends over at Not Auto Corp, it might be tough to stick a car underneath the tree, uh, but if you are thinking that it's winter time, maybe it's time to get into a new vehicle. Uh, before you do anything, talk to the folks at Not Auto Corp. Uh, why not get into the car of your dreams at an incredible price with the help of the Not team? You can check out all the amazing stock they have on site at Waverly and McGilvery. Or if there's a particular type of vehicle that you've always been dreaming of, talk to them. They'll help find it for you and get it for you here in Winnipeg. Not Auto Corp is at Waverly and McGilvery. You can check out the new sign up on the building for the Winnipeg Car Lab as well. And, uh, of course, everything available online at not.ca. All right, we're going to talk bombers in a few minutes with Ed Tate. Um, but Remo, great stuff with Marat and uh, a lot coming out of the uh, Jets practice today, including a little bit of David Gustafson and a little bit of coach Paul Maurice as well as they get ready to host Alex Ovechkin. And I couldn't help but laugh when uh, Marat mentioned the potential power play goal record tomorrow. I don't know what the cool bet line is going to be on Alex Ovechkin to break that record here, but it probably should be something like minus 1000 considering the amount of milestones we happen to see at the downtown arena. Yeah, Ovechkin scored his 600th goal against the Jets. I know uh, Yager, I, I've kept track of some, some of these milestone uh, points. Um, just back to Murata, I don't think anyone is saying, you know, Mark Trevi's a terrible player. I think people are just saying, hey, you know what, for what he's giving up, you know, maybe his usage uh, isn't optimal. I think that's that's the point. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm just I responding mean, yeah. to, yeah, I'm just responding to some some comments uh, in the chat that, I, that I've seen. And people are like, ah, Shreffley's not the problem. I don't think anyone's saying that, just saying that, you know, maybe uh, the minutes could be distributed a bit differently um, just to, compared to what's what's been happening. But as, as far as Ovechkin has, um, you know, I looked at his career splits. He has scored, you know, that he hasn't been in the Southeast division for like, you know, the Jets haven't been in the East for like five, six, seven years. He still scored like 48 goals against the Jets Thrashers, like second or third most. Um, he's got almost 100 points against the Jets Thrashers franchise. He murdered... Atlanta, and even we saw it here. And I mean, a Friday night game at home against Washington is just giving me flashbacks to, I believe it was uh, the 2012 uh, season. So uh, Ovechkin with an opportunity to set the all time power play goals record tomorrow night is a guarantee. A uh, guarantee for sure. <laughs> like, minus, yeah, minus a thousand. Uh, sure. Yeah, I think well, that's accurate. The Jets are going to need to score. If they want to win this game, they're going to need to score because, um, yeah, it's circle OV for getting one tomorrow night. Um, but hey, hopefully we're wrong. Hopefully we'll make a big deal about it and then look like dummies because the Jets' penalty kill steps oh. up. Or maybe they don't even take any penalties. That would be great too. Um, it needs to get better. But yeah, just finishing up the conversation on Mark Shifley. Um, 
you know, I, I guess the question is, is this the guy playing the way that he is right now um, without a change that's going to take you to that next level? And certainly offensively, I mean, like Marat said, a top 10, top 10 center in the National Hockey League when it comes to what he does offensively. But there's still, and, and I really hope that we might have seen, and I, and I do want to preface this, I think we have seen it at times. Like Marat was talking about his two-way game in the Edmonton series last year. I'll talk about the two Edmonton games this season. I thought he, his line really stepped up and matched that challenge going up against the Oilers, who were at the time the first place team in the West. And we saw what happened in that series. I mean, the Jets got three out of four points. Um, they were right there. And I think they only gave up, what, three goals in the 120 minutes of even, of, uh, of you know, of regulation time in it. Um, but as of late, I mean, there's been, I don't want to call it lackadaisical at times, but well, maybe I will. I mean, Marat sort of laid it out. I mean, the article's got a great piece. I mean, over and over again, there's you know, spots that you just need more from a guy in that position. And I would argue that Pierre-Luc Dubois has been giving that in both ends more and has been more effective offensively. So if that's the case, maybe it's time to, um, you know, even it out a little bit or maybe even flip it. And I wouldn't at all be surprised if that's the case tomorrow. I mean, you look at the way the lines are set up right now. We know what Kyle Connor has been doing. We know, everyone knows what du the season that Dubois had and how those guys play together. And the way things look right now, especially when you think about the matchups and who they'll be going up against with Maurice with that last change, um, I think there is part of that to these line changes going into tomorrow. And I would expect that the numbers between those two lines will be very similar at five on five, if not skewed in, du in the Dubois line's favor. And I don't think many people would have an issue with that. And I think that might be a good thing for Mark Shifley to get him going and um, to get a little bit more in all three zones because if you want to be a playoff team and a championship team, you're definitely going to need that, not just from one of your centers, but frankly, from all of them, but especially a guy that plays as much as Mark Shifley does. Comments available in the chat. Hit us up at Sports Talk WPG on Twitter with your comments if you're listening on the podcast. Um, I'll tell you what, Remus, this is a little bit of a, 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 a an audible here. We'll save coach for a little later on. Uh, but we're going to talk bombers in about five minutes with Ed Tate. Um, any chance that we could uh, maybe fire up the uh, the audio of the Gus bus? I know he was quite excited to talk after practice today about getting the recall and joining the team and making his season debut tomorrow night for the Winnipeg Jets. Perfect. Well, here it is. We heard the sound at the start. We've seen the graphic. Here is David Gustafson, who spoke earlier today after Jets practice. Your season so far. I'm very happy with the start of my season. I feel like uh, it's been going good, both for me and the moves down there. And uh, just uh, I feel like it's uh, been a good, good start of the season so far. When did you find out you were being called up, and what was your reaction? Uh, well, uh, I got it yesterday, and uh, you know I was happy. I mean, this is this is what I want. This is what you play for. This is why you. That's why I move over here. I wanna wanna play in the NHL. Is there a greater I don't want to call it an expectation, but maybe the sense to be ready more than ever before uh, at the AHL level, David, just because of what's going on with COVID and that sort of thing. I mean, do you always have to be on your toes for that opportunity now? Well, I mean, yeah, I feel like uh, you always have to be ready. And I feel, uh, I mean, as uh, soon as something has happened up here, the, like I got to be ready that I might be called up. And I feel like I've been that all season and I'm definitely ready now. I know you mentioned it preseason in the training camp. It was a pretty uh, neat thing to, to gain the team MVP honor. How about being named one of the captains? Is that just a, a another feather in the building cap? Yeah, I mean, it's an, it's an honor. And it's, it's nice to see that the coaches really trust me, and especially that they feel like I'm not just good on the ice. They like the way I uh, act outside the ice, too, and uh, I like the way I act to my teammates. And it's just nice to hear that from somebody. A little familiarity there with uh, Christian and and Jansen. It looks like you're going to step in and, and play with tomorrow night. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I know them both since a couple of years. I mean, we've been to uh, development camps together, so it's nice to see all of us three being up here playing together now. These last couple of days, I understand that the Moose had a test a positive the other day, and then there was some additional testing that was required. So. Has it been kind of a strange few days because you had to maybe undergo a little more testing than usual? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, I mean it's COVID. Like it's been like this a couple of years, so I know that this stuff might happen. So I just had 
uh, two days where I did basically nothing, just testing to make sure I didn't have it. But I mean, I feel like that's nothing, nothing you can't handle. What have you Speaking been told uh, to expect for your role in your time up here? Um, not much really. I mean, uh, I think it's pretty clear. I, I know what I have, what's, what uh, the expectations are. And, uh, you know, I, I just want to be up here and do as, as good as I can and hopefully stay up here. Watching Manitoba, like, as I've done a few times, you are big minutes in all three situations. Um, I don't expect maybe being thrown right onto the first power play here necessarily, but have you been in the PK meetings? Are you expecting that kind of role as well? Uh, I mean, we haven't really had any PK meetings. I mean, it's my first day, so I don't know yet, but uh, I feel like uh, that if I'm up here for a while, it uh, might be a chance for me to like get a spot there maybe later. Uh, David Gustafson, all aboard the Gus bus. Kenny's at the wheel. I'll be taking tickets at the front of it. You're all welcome on it. Uh, looking forward to seeing what he can do in the lineup. Hopefully, as you mentioned, help the PK at some point when he gets an opportunity. But I think all those three graduates of the Moose, Harkins, Veselainen, and Gustafson, be an exciting fourth line to see. Um, so um, long time coming. Seems to have a great attitude. Very excited to be here. And uh, that'll be another interesting story heading into tomorrow's game when the Washington Capitals come to town. Uh, and I'll tell you what, if he does get on the PK, we just talked about a certain Alexandro Fetchkin that's looking to set a record. Wouldn't that be cool if he actually was able to help stymie that Caps power play and keep them off the board? Um, we are going to get to some bomber talk. What a night it was last night at IG Field. And I know afterwards, um, a little chilly leaving the building afterwards, but nothing that we couldn't handle. And I know a lot of people went uh, to uh, their favorite watering holes, hoisted a couple. And when you're talking about Winnipeg, there's nothing better than the great taste of Little Brown Jug Beer. Of course, the 1919 is the iconic brand, but they also have a new brew celebrating their fifth anniversary, which is the champagne-like extra dry IPA called the Brute IPA with flavors in citrus and stone fruit. They've got beautiful five-year tulip glasses available. And man, the gift of Little Brown Jug is uh, very popular under the tree. They've got curated gift boxes as well. You can do yourself or get ones that are already made. You can find out more at the Tap Room on William Avenue or check them out online at littlebrownjug.ca with free delivery right now in the city of Winnipeg. So no excuses. Make your order. Get it delivered to you. You won't even need the home and you will be the best holiday host around town this year in Winnipeg and in Manitoba. Our friends at Princess Auto still buzzing over the big win for the Blue Bombers. Great supporters of the blue and gold. And of course, very exciting times coming up when it comes to the Princess Auto curling teams. Hodgson and Carey just qualified for the mixed doubles Olympic qualifiers, which is coming up in uh, Portage La Prairie. And of course, Jennifer Jones, the queen, the goat, going back to the Olympics. Princess Auto, proud sponsors of curling in Canada and Manitoba and the place where you'll find the best deals on the most unique assortment of tools and equipment around and everything you need to complete the projects on your list or start something new is at Princess Auto. There's two locations here in Winnipeg. Pop in, check out some great ideas for Christmas or you can shop online 24-7, 365 at Princess Auto. And uh, man, great night to head to a Boston pizza always great you know you always got the great pizza the boston's wings the ice cold schooners but oh do we have an nfl football game tonight my chiefs taking on the chargers big afc west matchup that's going to kick off just after seven of course boston pizza great place to watch nfl action the winnipeg jets and the rest of the national hockey league with the center ice package at all locations and of course was wild at BP the last couple weekends watching the Bombers on the way to a second Grey Cup championship, which we celebrated last night. Let's talk a little bit more about the Grey Cup champions, as well as maybe get a little bit of an idea about behind the scenes, how much fun everyone's been happened since that final whistle. And when you think of fun on Winnipeg Sports Talk, you think of Ed Tate, who joins us again. Eddie, how are you doing? How have the last few days been for you, my friend? They've been wild. Let's say it's been wild. It's been fun for all the right reasons, right? I mean, there was a moment in Sunday's game where I was writing the other story, right? And uh, that would have made the last few days a lot worse if uh, they hadn't rallied and got it done when it mattered. But it's been wild. I haven't gone nearly as hard as some of the other guys, but uh, 
I got my fun in Sunday night. Let's put it that way. And the rest have been kind of on fumes right now. It seems like the the league and keeps announcing stuff. The CFL All Star team came out. The the schedule came out. I'm expecting that they're going to announce something right about when I'm opening my Christ, uh, Christmas presents too, the way they're at it here. <laughs> hey, if you're with us on YouTube right now, you can check out that great photo oh, of Ed uh, with the Grey Cup afterwards tweeted out by our pal Gary Lawless. Um, oh man, congratulations to you and everyone there, first of all. And I will say this, a lot of the people, I mean, we're talking about the coaches and the players. Uh, I got to give a big shout out to everyone behind the scenes that put together such a great night last night at IG Field. Um, you know, those things just don't happen. You don't just snap your fingers. I'm sure there was a lot of people behind the scenes that were involved in working very hard and putting that on. And um, man, it was a special night for the Bomber fans that were able to get out to IG Field to celebrate with the champs. Yeah, you know, you make a good point. Let's salute those guys because it's not easy. You know, in 2019, there was the parade, you know, downtown through Portage of Maine and down to the Forks. And, you know, they had to arrange a, a lot of things for that too. But it, it kind of was a little bit more organic, I think. You know, people coming out of the, their homes and businesses and hanging from the rafters and throwing beers at the players. It was That was fun in itself. But because of the different rules we're under last night, you know, they had to do a lot of things with the – the jumbotron and the music and it had to be a lot more choreographed and they did a good job all i did was interview a few players and then try to write a story out of it from the press box so i uh, applaud all those people that made it look like a real pro uh, operation last night it was good really in the press box last night ed hmm once a soft media guy, always a soft media, I guess, huh? Never change. What am I supposed to do? I, I can't use my fingers if they're frozen. <laughs> Just busting your balls, man. Uh, let's go back to Sunday. Um, okay. What a game. What a challenge for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Credit where credit's due. I mean, I was... I was shocked at just how well the Ticats played on the line of scrimmage. I mean, that sort of has been the foundation of the Bombers beating up on these teams for the last couple of years. And uh, and it wasn't the case. And this was as great a test as we've seen this Winnipeg Blue Bombers team get really since they won the last great cup in 2019. Yeah, that's a real good point. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people saw when Ted Laurent was their defensive tackle was ruled out on the Friday. I think it was maybe officially on Saturday because of the appendectomy he had. I thought a lot of people figured that Winnipeg would really be able to pound the ball even more so against Hamilton's front. But man, Jagarrett Davis had a hell of a game for them, uh, especially for the through the first three quarters. And and they did give Bombers all they could handle, especially up front. Uh, and, you know, Hamilton was able to pick its spots. They, you know, used the wind effectively like Winnipeg did when they had it. You know, but when it mattered most, do you remember just before the Darvin Adams touchdown in overtime, there were two, three, four runs by Andrew Harris where it was just what we had expected, right? They pounded the ball right up the middle at that Hamilton defense and kind of wore them down. And so while it was a, it might not have, uh, you know, you might not have got a knockout like some people thought. You had to go right to the final bell to get the decision in that final round. The guys that, uh, that got it done all year, got it done again. You know, it wasn't just the old line. It was the defense that was outstanding. What, uh, in your opinion, what was the turning point in the game? Uh, other than switching sides from the third quarter to the fourth quarter and getting the win. Yeah, some people will say the, the coin toss at the beginning I, of the game, right? Yeah. Adam, was, Adam Big Hill's biggest play, calling heads. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, that doesn't show up on his resume for most outstanding defensive player, but <laughs> that, that, that counts. Um, well, a couple of things stand out for me. It's hard to pinpoint one moment. It's still kind of a blur to me, to be honest. I think the Nick Dembski touchdown was massive because you, at that moment, you could start to feel the momentum shift a little bit. They had the wind and they get a score and you think, okay, they're right back in this thing. But let's go right down to the final play of regulation with that Dietrich Nichols knocking that ball all the way. That was a sure touchdown. Hamilton would have won on that play. And that's a hell of a play he makes. And then he's involved in the in overtime too on the game ceiling interception by Kyrie Wilson, which was an amazing play, tipped by Winston Rose to or by Nichols to Rose to Wilson. Um, it, it, that was a special play. The Darvin Adams touchdown. There's a lot of things that stand out, but I guess two for me would be the Dembski touchdown and the Nichols play at goal line at near the end of regulation. Well, and you, you talk about, I mean. <laughs> For a team that had a historically great defense, and Brandon Alexander was on with us yesterday, and he sort of chuckled when I asked him this, but, I mean, 
I can't think of a more appropriate way for a legendary defense that had so many contributors over the course of the year to win a championship on a walk-off, game-ending, season-ending pick that was touched by three different members of the defense before it ended up being a, you know, on the ground. Yeah, you know, think about that a little bit because let's examine that. People talked about, you know, the Bombers returning so many players and the continuity and how important it was, but Dietrich Nichols wasn't on the team in 2019. He's a CFL All-Star. DeAndre Alford wasn't on the team in 2019. He's a CFL All-Star. Winston Rose wasn't with the team at the beginning of the year. He makes a play at the end. Alden Darby wasn't on the team. He, he, they made a trade for him during training camp when Mercy Maston went down. He had a pick in the Great Cup game. So, you know, there there were some players on defense that uh, when training camp started, we we thought, who the hell are these guys? And they, you know, not only became All-Stars, where their fingerprints are all over that win, too. Well, I mean, I remember you coming on with us as we were getting ready for the season. They had 35 DBs in camp. <laughs> 35. Yeah. I mean, I guess when you have that many, uh, chances are you're going to find one or two. But yeah. I mean, honestly, Ed, going into the season, I don't think anyone could have imagined the seasons that Alford and Nichols had. And uh, maybe that's a nice little segue into not just those two, but nine of their teammates being named all Canadians yesterday by the CFL. You know, uh, 11 All-Stars, I had to go back and look. It's a it's a bomber record. So they started doing the CFL All-Star team in 1962. And remember, before a lot of this, it was the Western uh, the Western Intercollegiate Rugby Union or whatever they called it, and then the, the Ontario League. There was, wasn't even really a league until the late 50s formally. So 62, as they started doing this, and 11 All-Stars is the most – in bomber history they had 10 in 1984 and 10 in 1987 so um remarkable year you know you only have 24 starters on that all-star team and 11 of them are bombers so and you probably could have made an argument for a couple others too right so uh, again it's really cool it's all fun but just imagine how the narrative would be today if they didn't get it done sunday that you know that all-star thing would have been forgotten people wouldn't be about as a excited about the schedule coming out today as they are be, because it would have still been the it would have been a nasty hangover from sunday instead of a good hangover <laughs> no doubt um hey you know while you mentioned we won't go, go through the entire schedule but um you know remus and i were kind of going through it beforehand um will anything stand out to you other than the fact that after going through an entire season without seeing paul apelis in the ottawa red blocks yeah they get them home and home in the first two weeks of the season before the Grey Cup rematch with the Hamilton Tiger Cats in week three. Yeah, I imagine that uh, the guys in Ottawa aren't too happy when they saw the schedule come out. It's like, wait a minute, we're trying to rebuild this thing and we get the Grey Cup champs back to back to open the season? Thanks a lot. Um, that was such an oversight last year or this year when Winnipeg didn't play Ottawa. I've got a piece up on the on the site already about the schedule and some of the things that jumped out to me. It's just good to get back to 18 games, hopefully. Uh, there's the three buys in there. There's the Labor Day game, the banjo ball, all the things that matter. There's one stretch in the summer where the Bombers are on the road for three games in a row, which just seems ridiculous. And then there's also a, a back-to-back -back on the road where they're in Toronto and then BC, I believe, and it's within five days. So, you know, there's always something that people are going to complain about, the coaches and players, but um, – I just hope we can get back to 18 games and seeing everybody again because uh, this past year was weird, but a good weird. Yeah, no, no. Well, it was it was weird last night, but again, a good weird was a good way to a good way to describe it. Um, you know, what a turnout. Um, you know, and I guess a really special day. I mean, for Bob, like was that Bob Irving's final official duty as the voice of the Bombers, like publicly? I'm sure he'll MC a dinner for you know the Great Cup champs at some point, but publicly for bomber fans and it was great walby did an awesome job as well as a number of other people giving bob the the due respect that he is deserving but i mean i guess that sort of was the uh was the final act for bob and what a way to go out with back-to-back -back championships and not uh, being the mc for another big party here in winnipeg yeah you know i make no bones about the fact he's one of my best buddies and so uh we flew back on monday and on the our charter and and i guess he flew back too and about Tuesday at five o'clock, I get this phone call and I hadn't talked to Bob since before the game. And it's like, 
what you know i was how he talks what the hell i'm i'm done i'm finished and you don't even call me anymore <laughs> why didn't you call me and so um he yeah he was talking about how wednesday night would be his last official act and he did it like he always does with with style and just such a pro um but what a way to finish right what a way to finish that uh he was at the after party and he was talking about that because we missed each other I didn't get back to Burlington till about 1230 when we were finished doing all our uh, content stuff and we were helping some of the guys pack up some of the equipment and stuff. And by the time we got back, the party was already rocking and rolling and there were two levels to it. And I went downstairs because there was some food and I didn't realize and someone came up to me and said, hey, do you know that Bob's upstairs? And so I go running upstairs. It was a kind, of, kind of a nightclub. And I thought, why would Bob be in here? But I guess he was for a while. I just missed him. So that's why he was probably giving me the gears yesterday when he called about ignoring him. Um, but take, I mean, we've seen uh, a lot of the uh, the videos that the players have put on Instagram. Of course, right. the, I mean, I can't imagine. You ever been on a flight like the one uh, that you were on back from Hamilton to Winnipeg, Ed? Uh, I'm trying to remember what 2019 was like. That was a bit of a blur too. No, it was fun. It's just fun. It's, you know, these guys work so hard. And, you know, there was a little bit, not a little bit, a lot of extra stress. And it was different this year with the, the the protocols and having to come in three times a week to get tested and just being really cautious about that. I don't think uh, a lot of people appreciate how much stress that brought on everybody, right? You didn't want to be the one person that got it and, and everybody else points at you as if there's a spread or, you know, people have to sit out. That plane ride back was fun. It was... Uh, I've told the story a couple times now, but uh, a lot of the staff and coaches and doctors or anything were at the front of the plane. I was about row 13 or 14, and then behind me and back were all the players. And we weren't, we were just barely had taken off where you could hear the guys in the back yell, tarps off, and they all take their shirts off and they're, they're pounding the, the drinks and the music's gone. And, uh, you know, they asked Darren Cameron to come back. For something i think they kind of tricked him and then the minute he gets back there they told him he had to take his shirt off too like everybody he else. was all over that any okay. excuse for dc to do a little flexing of around course. some people he was all in on that 100 exactly. but that you know i said to riley uh our video guy excellent video guy you're sitting beside me i said there's no chance in hell i'm going back there because nobody wants to shoot, see me with my shirt off if I have to hold it for two hours, I will. I'm not going back there to go to the bathroom or anything. But it was it was fun. It was very tame. After we landed, I had, apparently the the flight attendant said to the uh, Michael Shea that um, it was a really well behaved and respectful bunch, which is great because I don't know. I just finished reading the Jeff Perlman's book on the 1986 Mets, and I guess they got a huge, they got a huge bill from the airline when they came back because they just crashed the thing. I don't even know how it landed from the stories I read about that that party after they won the World Series. Hey, um, you know, we know and we hear from Mike O'Shea all season long. He is uh, as all business of an individual as there is. He's always focused on the next game, the next practice, the next thing. Um, well, now next season is a little far away. How's the coach been enjoying things? And how much does he change once the final buzzer has gone and his team has the Grey Cup? Um, uh, I remember seeing him and talking to him in the weeks after the 2019 Grey Cup. And it's just amazing to see because he is such a regular down-to-earth guy that likes to have fun and certainly has earned the right to do that. Um, but not until the job is finished. Now the job is finished. How's, uh, how's yeah. coach been enjoying the last few days? Well, he did some interviews before last night's celebration. He came out, of course, it's cold, and he came out in a T-shirt and stood there for 15 minutes and did <laughs> interviews. He's the toughest guy around. And then, uh, you know, he talked about, uh, somebody asked him about the rumors about the GM and head coach job in Edmonton being, his name being associated with that. He says, I'm not thinking about that. I just want to drink some more beers with my with my team. And then afterwards, him and his wife, Rashir, are out there cleaning up. Joey Slattery had a great video of a picture of him out there picking up the empty beer cans and stuff after the game. He's a beauty. He he got on the intercom as the plane was landing and, you know, changed the schedule so that the players didn't have to come in too early the next day or for exit meetings. And and as he signed off, you know, he said, uh, you know, he gave a speech and, and he said, and by the way, that wasn't bad yesterday. 
talking about the game. And it's just kind of <laughs> low keying, you know, an overtime win and great cup to go back to back. Um, you know, you can see why the players love him. He's so genuine. And um, you're right, though. Once the season's over, I think his guard comes down a little bit and he's, he's not afraid to have a few beers with his, uh, with his team. Well, we're certainly hoping to uh, catch up with the coach in the weeks to come. And, uh, you know, now I give a little bit of space from the celebration and everything and look back. It's just a, an absolutely special team, uh, a special year um, with, uh, you know, a real special leader that uh, that we've been uh, following throughout his career now. Uh, it, I have to ask you, Ed, I mean, you're, you've been following this team for a long time. I mean, just when it comes to Mike O'Shea, I mean, he's now the second winningest coach in Blue Bomber history. He's the architect and leader of a repeat championship, which hasn't happened in what, just about 60 years. I believe 61 was the last time it happened. Mm -hmm. um, we know Bud Grant is the standard for Winnipeg coaches, but um, I would say that we can now start having the conversation that if Mike O'Shea stays here in Winnipeg and continues to lead this club, um, the potential of Mike O'Shea to be right there alongside the greatest that have ever done it with this team and this league, certainly on the table. He's got a lot, oh. a lot of years left. Right. So I think technically Husky's third because I think he's behind Cal still, Cal Murphy in wins. But uh, there's two statues, right? There's Bud Grant and there's Cal Murphy in front at IG Field. And I think if Mike O'Shea keeps piling up the wins like he does, uh, you know, there could be a third statue because you're right. It's been since 1961, 62 that since this team went back to back. Bud Grant's a legend, and Cal Murphy's a legend, and Mike O'Shea is right there too. If if he's comfortable and wants to stay here, and I know he likes Winnipeg, loves Winnipeg, and I think the organization will do what they can to keep him here, then um, there's nothing to stop him. He's still young too. That's the other thing people forget. You know, he's uh, if he wants to keep coaching, he could go for a couple more decades here, right? I don't know. No doubt. No doubt about it. Yeah, absolutely. And the run. I keep going back. I started with the team in 2016 after leaving the paper. And remember, that's the summer where they were one and four, and there was all kinds of rumors about his future and all that. And they make the quarterback change from Matt Nichols to Matt Nichols from Drew Willie, crank out seven wins. I'd have to do the math, but look at the one loss record since that winning streak started. It is remarkable. And um, again, that's, that's Mike O'Shea. That's the organization for sticking with him. But that's his blueprint coming forward too. Uh, we talked earlier today uh, about you know just some of the highlights of the of the event last night and some of the players that were having some fun that stood out. But you know one of the things that stood out to me was actually the speech from Kyle Walters. I mean he absolutely nailed it. He got the crowd going up. He was doing his things and he sort of said that you know last year when you know we finished up the uh, parade, I said you know what this was so much fun. I think the plan for the off season is to bring all these guys back and try and do it again. It took a little longer, but here we are. And uh, guess what the plan is this summer? Try and bring these guys back and do it again. Um, the players are finished. The coaching's finished. But now Kyle Walters gets to work. And, um, you know, I would imagine that while there's still a ton of players that will need to be re-signed, with the success that this team has had, the um, incredible connection these guys seem to have with each other, with the organization, with the city, with the fans, um, probably an enviable position as far as general managers go, despite all the work that's going to need to be done to get pen to paper. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting, Huss, because I think that we're kind of at a bit of a crossroads here in a way, because, you know, in the build up to 2019, the players knew they had something going here and they wanted to be around it. And they, they got it done in that memorable November. And then we lost the season in 2020. And, we, and then leading into this year, you know, the players had to take pay cuts, but there was a, you know, a, a real consensus to let's do whatever we can to keep this together and take another shot at it. So I guess my concern would be if I could take a step back would be that these, this team's won two in a row now. And as lot, as many, as much as a lot of players would like to come back and, and maybe go for the three P there's probably a lot of guys who are saying, you know, I don't get to play for very long. And if Team X is offering me more money or more playing time, I'm out. And that's something that the Bombers are going to have to to wrestle with. Their depth could be really tested here. Um, and, you know, teams come after the champions, right? They always want to poach. They poach your personnel. They poach your players. So the next few months are going to be very interesting for Kyle Walters and company because uh, 
this team, you like, like you say, you want to keep it intact, but uh, there's going to be a lot of names on that depth chart that are going to be targeted by other teams around this league, and that's going to be fascinating to watch. Well, Brandon Alexander said yesterday on the program, coined a new phrase, it's Winnipeg or nothing. So uh, hopefully that's the case when uh, the guys are talking to Kyle Walters and we see most of these characters back looking to do it for a third consecutive time next season. Ed, I know you got, you know, despite the celebrations continuing, yeah, you mentioned there is a lot of work to do. Folks can go to bluebombers.com for the latest on the schedule, the All-Stars, everything else happening. Uh, and credit to you and the content team. You mentioned Riley. Um, I mean, like that week, of seeing what was being cranked out, both on the site, the videos they put on social media. I said this to Remus last night. Like, I, I mean, I'm consuming a lot of content from teams all around North America, and I'm not sure there's many, if any, that do it better than the crew you're working with there. So uh, hats off to everyone there behind the scenes as well. What a magical year. Great night. And uh, as I said, hopefully in about 50 weeks, maybe we'll be having similar conversations, but still a lot of work to go. Ed, thanks for everything this year. We love you. Everyone in the chat appreciates your time. Have a great holiday with the family and uh, congratulations again and uh, enjoy that ring ceremony whenever it happens. Yeah, whenever it happens. Hey, appreciate you having me on all season. Uh, you and Remo have done a great job with this thing, Huss. It's really fun. And uh, so I, like, I'm doing a lot of saluting. I salute you guys. I salute Bomber fans and happy holidays, everybody. Thanks. Hey, good times in the peg right now, Eddie. Thanks so much. Yeah. There it is. Ed Tate. You can follow him on Twitter at Ed Tate WFC and check out all the great work Ed does. Um, feeding Bomber fans the information they need over at bluebombers.com. Um, all right. We are going to hear from Coach Paul Maurice. And then after hearing from the coach, we will let you know who is the winner of these prime seats to tomorrow's game, courtesy of our friends at Canadian Club. Of course, there was uh, was some CC being poured last night, a few beers being going in the crowd last night. One more time at IG Field, of course, the uh, Canadian Club folks are the official spirit and whiskey of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers and a great supporter of ours. We'll have another marble race tomorrow with another Winnipeg Sports Talk hoodie to be given away. See if I might be able to get into the tickle trunk and have a uh, I Love Rye package as well, including some of the great taste at Canadian Club. But right now for the holidays, head down to your local Manitoba Liquor Marts. You'll have the, you be eligible to win 5,000 air miles when you purchase Canadian Club, as well as bonus air miles on your purchase. For more details, look at the Canadian Club display in all of your local Manitoba Liquor Marts. And... Uh, Hey, our pal Nick from uh, the Nick and Nicky DQ group has popped in. Uh, shout out to Nick. I have to tell you, there's a couple things that uh, that they've got going on right now, including, now this is only at the St. Anne's location, but a, a special plug now going into Christmas. Buy all their box novelties, Dilly Bars, Buster Bars, my personal favorite, the uh, ice cream sandwiches as well. Buy one box, get the second for just 99 cents. It's a great deal to stock the freezers for the holidays. So that's at the St. Anne location, the St. Anne's location only. And of course, St. Anne's now open year round, usually was a seasonal, not anymore now that Nick and Nikki are running it. So uh, it's open there for you. You can also order at Skip and Uber Eats for you folks out in St. Vital and head on over to their Instagram at DQ Manitoba. That's also the place where you can uh, give them your order for a cake and pick it up at any of the four Nick and Nicky DQs, DQ Niverville, Northgate, Polar Park, or St. Anne's. But they've got amazing prizes with their 12 days of Christmas giveaway. So head on over to DQ Manitoba and get that done and pop by for that great deal at the St. Anne's location. All right, we're going to get to Cool bet lines. I'm so fired up for this football game tonight. Urban Meyer got fired as well. Maybe touch on that for a couple minutes before the end of the program. Uh, but of course, our focus is on the Jets and Bombers. Had some great Bomber chats. We had Murata Tesh earlier. We heard from David Gustafson. One person we do want to hear from coming out of today's practice and heading into tomorrow's game against the Washington Capitals is Winnipeg Jets head coach Paul Maurice. He spoke for a few minutes today after practice. Let's hear some of that right now. It, it seemed like, you know, you were definitely trying Christian Veseline in, in certain spots, giving him a look, you know, Harkins. It, it didn't look by the way that the lines were constructed, like David Gustafson was a top of mind player at that time. Uh, why not, if I'm right with that, and, and if not, uh, well, I, I guess, why is he here now? 
basically from what he's done in the minors. He's played really well. We, we want those young players to play big minutes. We, we, we don't want them. The fourth line in the NHL is not a big minute role. So when they're young and they're developing their game, that's where we want to play as much as we possibly can. You've always kind of said that would might be his role, though, up here. Right. So has that changed then? Have you seen? No, no it'll be the same role, right? No, we, we need a player, for one. Like right. we, we have a need. So we have to call somebody up. He's played really well down there. Um, so that, that's why he's the guy. They have a really good penalty killing unit statistically down there, and yeah. he's a big part of that. So do you envision putting him right in on that or maybe gradually working yeah. into it? Yeah, that would be something he'd work to. Right? We'll, we'll see his five-on-five -five game, see how comfortable he is. Don't want to throw a whole bunch of things at him first, but let him build into it. And would their system be very similar to you, Paul? You yes. want to, they're using the same PK yeah. there, right? Shifley takes a PK shift at the end of last game. I think that's probably just in case you can grab some offense out of it. But no. is there a role for Oh, yeah, yes. Sorry, yes. Yes. Right. So we, we're down one at that point at time. You get him out early. Yeah. So it's not like his long term plan isn't to maybe audition to go to that spot. Paul, it seemed like yesterday's practice was a little more quiet. Today was much different. Today looked a lot more with the energy and the yeah. chatter and that. Yeah. Was that something. Am I wrong in observing that? Well, or I think that's exactly the point of the last two days. We got to get them sprinting again. I think that we were like sluggish in our game. I understand why. Got to get back on central time. So yesterday we went up and down the ice with as many sprints as we could get. But it wasn't an hour long to the point that they would bring it into practice today. The idea was that we could go fast today without uh, you know, depleting them. So we did. We got we got two good sprint days in, and uh, and you're right, we did we had more energy and and we were quicker today. Well, what are some of the markers you'll look for when you're looking at that shutdown line when you have Adam and, and Andrew together? Where the game's played with those guys, they, they get out and play in the offensive zone against the other team's best, then they're doing their job. What has Dominic Tony Nato done to kind of earn that promotion in that spot there? I, I think he has it in his style DNA to understand that if you play, you can change your game depending on who you play against. Um, I also want to put Vesson and Harks, you know, it's kind of three young guys going out there. Sometimes they go out and just play the game now. They're not deferring to anybody. They can get into a, I thought we saw it in practice today, just get into a real straight line game, get in, get on the body, and then not worry about where the other guy is or trying to keep him happy or passing pucks. I, I, I've been happy with Vesson's game. There wasn't obviously any great standouts in our last game, but just a little change there. And I'm going to flip those. I'm going to flip all three of those right, right wingers during the game, I would think. I remember last year, I think it was last year, two years ago, when you put, um, I guess it would have been two years ago, Jack Roslevic, Mason Appleton, <coughs> Jansen Harkins, and you kind of found something there with yeah. those three young guys. Um, and I remember you saying, like, maybe they all take ownership of, because they're all in a similar boat. Yeah. So is that kind of what you're hoping maybe? So might well, I think they can, there's going to be energy for all three of them. I mean, they, they should be able to drive. But I think when, when you don't play... Changes who they play against, for one, and it changes that idea that you've, you've got to keep somebody happy. I, I just hadn't felt our bottom six was particularly defined. You know, I've, I've spread it out a little bit, so, um, and that in part is because Shife and Wheels are gone, and then Wheels goes back out of our lineup. Stas was out for a bit, so we haven't been able to structure a whole lot, but I, I like a little bit more de definition on our bottom six, so I have an idea what's coming off the bench. Christian and David have played together before and had quite a bit of success with the Moose, too. Yeah. I mean, is that, you see that as a benefit also? Well, it's, it's not a negative, right, Ken? We would look at that and say, hopefully, we can see a little bit of that. They'll talk to each other on the ice. They, they, uh, all, all of those things matter, right? That connection between a player that, you know, what are you going to do when this happens? I just wanted to chip that puck. You go. Like, the, those little small conversations that have at a bench will speed a lineup. But I imagine you saw the things you wanted to see in a young player that he didn't go down and woe is me and sulk as some guys maybe would in that situation. We, we saw what we wanted to see almost in the very first time he hit the ice in development camp years ago. We are going, I think that guy's going to play. right? First of all, he's just physically strong man. Speed and the speed of the game. So he's not the fastest guy in the league. So he needs some pro experience and so his brain can catch up that will make him faster read the play because if you're not real quick and you're and you take all young players take longer to read a play then you play slow 
So he needs some pro experience to read the game, so his reads. Now, he's a smart guy. He's going to get the reads. And once he gets the reads, the question is how quick can he play that game? Um, but the very first, you know, development camp, we, we tugged him real hard, and, and it was a hard practice. And right toward the very end, he was the only guy left that could still go hard, and he was still smiling. So he likes the work, he likes to work hard, and he has the capacity to work hard. So anyway, I, I look at this guy in some ways, and it's complete, but it's, it's a version of Logan Stanley. You, you look at him the first day and say, okay, I think this guy's going to play, but it's going to take some time. It's going to take some years. He's just not, his feet aren't quick enough, and this, it would be the same with Logan. It just takes some time. Well, he's talked about All right, there is Coach Maurice talking David Gustafson. Uh, the line is looking, going into tomorrow's game against the Washington Capitals. Really intrigued about this game. I'm excited to see Lowry and Cop back together. I think that'll be a big, big boost for that third line. And when you look at the top two lines right now, with Shifu playing with Ehlers and Dubois playing with Connor, um, I think more than we've had since Connor and Dubois were split up and Blake Wheeler returned to the lineup. I think, you know, uh, really a, a competing pair of lines for ice time, minutes, opportunities. And hopefully that'll be good for both. And then, of course, spent a lot of time talking about that young fourth line with Jansen Harkins and Christian Veselainen on the wings and David Gustafson making his season debut. Heard from Gus earlier today on the program. Very excited to be back up with the big club. And we'll look forward to seeing what they can do tomorrow night. All right. In just a second, we are going to give away those tickets. Congratulations. Or thank you to everyone that entered. We'll be doing this more going forward. Again, you just what you had to do if you missed it yesterday, go to winnipegsports.com. We've got a contest page there now, and uh, you can enter through the website. It's a much fairer way so we can include all the folks that might not be listening live when we do the show in the afternoon, but are catching it on their drive home or later on the evening in the podcast. So we'll get to that in just a second, but let me quickly get to the cool bet lines while Remus prepares everything. Pretty busy night in the National Hockey League after a, a slow one with only three games last night. The uh, Florida Panthers, probably in a very ornery mood after getting absolutely pasted by the Ottawa Senators 8-2 to two on Tuesday night. thought the Jets had a bad night at the office. Uh, Panthers right there as well on Tuesday. Panthers minus 149 favorites against the Kings. Hurricanes 172 favorites against the Red Wings, although they're still dealing with COVID. No Sebastian Ajo, no Seth Jarvis. The good news is this game is going to be played. Uh, Flyers minus 159 favorites in Montreal to take on the Habs. Vegas, a big road favorite against the New Jersey Devils. The Sens, can they pull off the Florida double? They just pasted the Panthers. Well, they're plus 190 underdogs taking on the Tampa Bay Lightning. Pretty juicy number if you think the Sens have something going on right now, which they actually do. They've been playing very well as of late. Um, Islanders, a slight home favorite at home against the Boston Bruins. Bruins, of course, no Brad Marchand, no Patrice Bergeron as they deal with uh, some COVID issues. Wild, a massive favorite at home against the Buffalo Sabres. Wild had a few extra days rest because Carolina Hurricanes game against them was canceled or postponed on Tuesday. Sabres plus 265 coming off their win in Winnipeg. And a uh, couple final later games, Avalanche and Preds. Avalanche, a big fave, minus 182. And the Edmonton Oilers on a six-game losing streak look to snap it and salvage something out of this homestand, hosting the Columbus Blue Jackets. Edmonton minus 213 on the number. Oh, and the Sharks and Canucks late night tonight as well. Sharks minus 122. Canucks on their heater with Bruce Boudreaux behind the bench. A uh, plus 103 underdog on the road taken on the Sharks. And, of course, tonight we have a monster, monster game. Pat Mahomes, Justin Herbert, one of the great quarterback matchups going forward, probably for the next 10 years, going at it. Thursday night football, battle for first place in the AFC West. The Chiefs, three-point favorites in L.A. at SoFi Stadium to take on the Chargers. If you do like the Chargers right now, you're getting three points and plus 102 on that number. Of course, if you get to cool bet, you've got teasers, abs, uh, touchdown score numbers, player receiving, player passing. They always uh, get all the props out for the big primetime games. So uh, we'll see what we've got tonight. Hopefully I'll be in a great mood talking about a Chiefs win tomorrow. Uh, but if you do want to bet it, get over to Cool Bet. Use the promo code WST. If you've never played there before, you'll get a 100% bonus up to $200 on your first deposit. 
All right, Remus. Uh, I think it's time to give something away. Again, a little early, but the game is tomorrow. We wanted to make sure we gave these tickets out beforehand, so gave our winner plan to uh, you know time to prepare to get to that game. And of course, these tickets are courtesy of our friends over at Canadian Club, Section One Seventeen, Row Eight, Prime Seats, Lower Bowl. And um, Remo had a great turnout of a bunch of people, both live during the program as well as the podcast listeners that. Uh, entered later on we did the cutoff at the beginning of today's show we've got all the entries and uh it might be a good time to bring out the the wheel the wst wheel to give these tickets away yeah this was our first time doing this i think this is what we're going to be doing going forward when it comes to contests we just had it on our website winnipegsportstalk.com slash contest and we made this nifty little thing time's up you can't enter but you did gain additional entries for you know, first of all, you just have to give your name and email, but if you sign up for our new email list or any of the things which involve, you know, visiting one of our social media pages or giving us a follow, you got additional entries. So we kind of didn't really uh, publicize it. We kind of hit it in the middle of the show. So if, you know, you were one of those hardcore uh, WST listeners, you were either here in the YouTube chat yesterday, I know a bunch of chatters, but after the podcast was posted, we had a ton of, of entries come in. So... Uh, I do have them up here in the wheel of names. The wheel is kind of overloaded right now. Has Well, uh, that's fine. Everyone, thanks to everyone that entered. And and I think it, it was an important for us to do this because it's so easy and we appreciate everyone that joins us live every day. It makes it so mm. much fun having the live chat, getting the feedback from people live as we do the program. Um, but as popular as the YouTube show is, the podcast has been growing crazy over the last few months. Um, on an average day, it far outpaces what we get on YouTube, the amount of people that listen via audio um, at their convenience. So we did want to make sure that, um, you know, we'll always still do the, the marble race because that's just yeah. so much fun to do. And it's a great way to finish off the week. Um, but for some of these bigger prizes, we did want to make sure that we um, made it available for the mm -hmm. podcast listeners. So thanks to everyone on the pod that entered as well. Um, uh, well, Kamish, I think uh, it's time to click to spin and see who's going to the see the Jets and Caps, courtesy of Winnipeg Sports Talk and our friends at Canadian Club. Okay, yeah, let's see. And, you know, we'll be doing this again. I think more giveaways to come. We'll put them on our website, uh, get everyone involved. And uh, this is kind of the first one. So we'll, we're will we going to keep it going lots more. I'm, I'm Yeah, pumped. you know what? I'm going to pop by. I'm going to pop by Royal over the course of the next couple mm -hmm. of days. Of course, all of their Bomber Championship gear is coming in. Uh, maybe pick up a couple of items. And the next week, uh, with everything coming off, maybe we'll give away uh, maybe a Bomber tee or a championship hat or something like that. Pick up a few things. Of, and obviously, we've had such great sponsors. Uh, the Nick and Nicky DQ group and Canadian Club with the prizing for the uh, marble races. Um, as well as other people. It'll drop stuff off. I mean, our pal Chris uh, did it with one of those Grey Cup cakes. We had uh, Mike, who gave us some jet tickets a couple weeks ago that made some people really happy. So uh, fun to be able to do some of these giveaways on the program. But anyways, without further ado, let's get spinning and see who's going to see the Jets right. and Caps tomorrow night. I'm just going to hit this, and we're going to go. And I know it's probably tough to read all the names. There's like over 255 entries because a lot of people got six entries, and so we'll have that less. but. Here we go. I'm just going to hit it, and we'll see who's going to the game tomorrow. Let's Are go. Let's go. Ovi and the Caps coming to take on the Jets tomorrow night. The wheel is spinning. I can't even see, but it looks like the winner is... Mike Barrett. Way to go, Mike. There you go. I'm not sure whether Mike is with us in uh, chat, whether he is uh, a YouTuber or a podcast listener, but uh, Mike... Thank you for listening. Thank you for making Winnipeg Sports Talk a part of your day. And enjoy the game tomorrow night. Great thing about this is we, of course, have Mike's email because of the way that people entered. So as soon as the show's over, I'll be getting Mike's email. I'll be sending him the tickets. And uh, Mike, let us know how you enjoyed the game. And congratulations from Winnipeg Sports Talk and our friends over at Canadian Club. Yeah, um, I was going to say, Mike, entered, uh, he entered in the afternoon, huh? so I'm assuming he's a, uh, a podcast listener. So uh, congrats Perfect. to Mike. Perfect, Mike. Uh, well, anyways, enjoy the game tomorrow. Fingers crossed. I mean, the weekend games have been better. Um, the weekend games, I mean, that weekend we had a couple of weeks ago with that Devils game on Friday night coming off the shutout. It was a very different game from the disappointing performance against Arizona. So let's hope we get that same thing tomorrow night. Pretty dull game on Tuesday. 
Hopefully the Jets fire it up tomorrow and get a big win against the Washington Capitals. And you, Mike, will be enjoying it from some great seats, courtesy of our friends at Canadian Club. And then, of course, Sunday afternoon, right back at it. St. Louis Blues, big Central Division matchup, matinee game. Um, big weekend for the Winnipeg Jets, especially considering kind of a couple points left on the table earlier this week. Everything's so tight in the Western Conference and Central Division right now. Every point valuable. Um, but we'll talk more about the game tomorrow. Brandon Rewicki is going to join us, get his thoughts on the Jets heading into the weekend. Always love chopping it up with Brandon Rewicki. And as I mentioned, we are hoping that we will have the legend himself, Bob Irving, on the program tomorrow as well. Uh, if not tomorrow, at some point early next week. But we're hoping to pull it off tomorrow. So make sure you join us then uh, to do it. Uh, Remo, what's up for you tonight? I don't know, actually. Um, I know there's a lot of hockey games on, so maybe after this I'll get a DraftKings lineup in and try to sweat that out. That that could be an option for me, or I got to maybe do some other stuff uh, for Winnipeg Sports Talk website. It seems like every night I've been been working on working on things. So um, give us yeah, a follow. It's not all just champagne yeah. and caviar and two hours of laughs with me during the no. day. A lot of things going on behind the scenes. Actually, going to pop by a few sponsors after the program oh, today with a little holiday greeting and uh, see what's up. So, um, I, what? Any thoughts on this game tonight? My Chiefs going to keep it rolling, or are you uh, oh. are you riding with the home Chargers and the home dog at SoFi Stadium? I'm going with the I'm going with the chi- with the uh, Chargers here. I think the Chiefs. They got some bad karma there with the Jackson Mahomes uh, news today. God, getting... he's such an idiot. What did he do? Why I've been getting all these messages. You about haven't Jackson heard about Mahomes it, and I'm almost blocking. I, I I should make his name blocked in Twitter so I can't get triggered by this. But honestly, sometimes I think Pat Mahomes just wants to kill his family. I I'm joking, of course, so... but his brother is so damn annoying and just does. So many dumb things on social media. It's got to be quite embarrassing for uh, for Mahomes. So he got dragged online by a Casey cocktail bar. I guess he wanted to go in and they couldn't seat him because they were closed and he threw a hissy fit or something. Oh, my God. And so, hold on, I got to get it. So they came out and put out a apology towards him on social media which wasn't exactly an apology but then they but and they kind of <laughs> just called him uh entitled here where is it i gotta pull they and then he since like kind of redacted their their note but um they, they sent a bit of a heater his way um uh, if you're unfamiliar by the way i'll just update people so jackson mahomes oh. is patrick mahomes little brother and he fancies himself as somewhat of a TikTok star. He does these dumb little dances for social media all the time. I have no idea if he does anything else, really, other than just bumper shine the coattails of his brother's greatness. Um, but there has been some times where it's really been too much. And you wonder, like, how the lack of self-awareness of this dude and just the issues that he's giving his brother is nuts. And then, you know, when you get publicly flamed by a business within the city that he is the king of, um, certainly adds to the problem. Okay, here, here it is. I found it. It's time to have a talk. Today, we are experiencing a lot of activity over social media regarding a recent visit paid to us by an unhappy guest. This person happens to have a lot of followers on social media, and therefore, it is something we cannot ignore. Voice, reach, and influence are power. In our case, with many businesses that are locally owned, the power of a few social media personalities can make or break that business. This grants these people the certain power to affect our livelihoods. Yada, yada, yada. Let's get to the good part. Uh, Dear Jackson Mahomes, we are sorry that we set boundaries that you tried to ignore. Oftentimes, people with unearned status and a sense of entitlement think they are above the rules and will lash out at the employee enforcing them. We are sorry we cannot seat your very large group. As you probably saw, our bar is very small. We are sorry that you have the reach that you do, or at least you think you do, and that instead of using it for something positive, you decided to use it to try and crush a small business. We survived a global pandemic. We'll survive your ego. We are sorry you did. <laughs> this is amazing. We are sorry you didn't reach out to us before t- taking to social media. But then again, that is an expectation we would have f- from a mature and rational person, not someone who pours water on fans 
and dances over the, the memorials of tragically lost people for TikTok clout. Uh, referencing he danced over Sean Taylor's Sean number. Sean Taylor, yeah. Um, we have been fortunate enough, or sorry, we have not been fortunate enough to be born into a much more talented and much more famous family, but we would like to think that if we did have that much luck, we would use our influence in much more responsible ways. Uh, wow. Uh, yes. Well, uh, I'm just hoping that the Mahomes family ends today with a one and one record because uh, younger brother took a serious L today from the KC cocktail bar. And uh, big bro has got a big game tonight and hopefully he can get a win. You know what? Credit to the KC cocktail bar for doing that. I, 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 <laughs> you know, you probably run the risk of pissing off a few people that are, um, you know, huge Chiefs fans and love Patrick Mahomes. But to be honest with you, there's nothing worse than entitled people, especially for real no reason other than just luck of being birthed to um, give it to especially small businesses like that. So uh, anyways, shout out to uh, shout out to the Casey cocktail bar for that. Should be a great game tonight. And of course, tomorrow it's all about the weekend jets taking on the caps jets taking on the St. Louis blues. And uh, fingers crossed, we'll have a very, very special guest to wrap up Bombers Victory Week in one Bob Irving. Hopefully that's going to happen tomorrow. If not, it'll be early next week. But make sure you join us tomorrow. Uh, we'll have the latest on the Jets heading into the game. Rowicki, as I mentioned, and much more as well um, as the Bombers continue to uh, celebrate that back-to-back -back championship. Big shout out to all of our sponsors. Don't forget, Bomber Gear shipments are literally arriving every few minutes at Royal Sports. They're getting it all out right now. Head on down to Royal if you want to cop all that Bomber Championship gear. Our friends at F Apparel, Vita Health, Culligan Water, Manitoba Battery, Not Auto Corp, Little Brown Jug. Going to have a couple 1919s watching the game tonight, I think. Princess Auto, Boston Pizza. The Nick and Nikki DQ group, Canadian Club. Thanks again to CC for those tickets. And congratulations again to Mike Bart, who won. And of course, Cool Bet Canada. I'm on the Chiefs minus three tonight, folks. Um, have a great night. Thank you very much for listening. Shout out to Remus and everyone that entered in the contest. We'll try and do more of that heading into Christmas. Some few special WST Christmas giveaways next week. Um, but enjoy this night. Big sports weekend coming up. Enjoy the football game this evening. And thanks for being with us. Murata Tesh, Ed Tate, we love you. Appreciate you joining us. We'll see you tomorrow, folks. One o'clock. Bob Irving, Marble Race, Brandon Rewicki on the Jets. Going to be a great way to get into the weekend right here on WST. Oh my God! Oh! Shut it down! Let's go! Home! Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at WinnipegSportsTalk.com.